City Clerk, are we ready? It is six o'clock. Yes. Fantastic. Good evening, everybody. It is Tuesday, April 28th, and it is exactly 6 p.m. And I do call this City Commission regular meeting to order. Um, since we are doing a virtual meeting, I do have to do individual roll call. So when I call your name, please make sure you unmute and say you're here. Um, Vice Mayor Luke. Here. Commissioner Hanks. Here. Commissioner Carasaw. Here. Commissioner Emrich. Here. City Manager Lear. I am here. Thank you. City Attorney Slayton. Yes, ma'am, present. Thank you. And last but not least, City Clerk Miss Taylor. Here. Thank you so much. And uh, for the record, we do have a quorum to conduct this virtual meeting. At this time, I would like to ask, I'm sorry. At this time, I would like to go ahead and ask everybody to please stand. We'll take a moment of silence. And if I could please have um, Ms. Taylor um, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the Republic, Republic which stands one nation, nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Ms. Taylor. Since we are doing a virtual meeting, I would like to ask the city attorney to please give an overview on how the um, virtual meeting process works. City attorney. Thank you, Mayor. In accordance with the governor's executive order 20-69, and the city manager's emergency order number 2020-06 revised. This is a virtual meeting with the elected officials, charter officers, city staff, and presenters participating through video conferencing using Zoom, which is a form of communications media technology. If there are any technical difficulties that prevent the use of the technology for the conduct of the meeting, the meeting must be recessed or adjourned until the problems have been corrected. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, City Hall is closed to the public. Information about ways to watch the live stream or listen to the meeting and to provide public comment are posted on the city's website at www.cityofnorthport.com slash online meetings. That information is also posted on the front windows of City Hall and is attached to the agenda for this meeting. This meeting is being broadcast live on the city's website, live on YouTube, accessible on video via the Zoom app and accessible by telephone via Zoom. To provide public comment, you can submit a written comment via the online public comment form on the city's website at cityofnorthport.com slash public comment. The form becomes active at 9 a.m. the day before the meeting and will be deactivated at the end of public comment during the meeting. Public comment may also be made by leaving a voicemail message via telephone at 941 429-1032. Voicemail messages are accepted the day before the meeting from 8 a.m. until 7 p.m. Required information is referenced on the online form and in the outgoing voicemail message. Comments meeting these requirements that are timely submitted will be accepted and included in the official record of the meeting. Any comment received that does not meet the public comment requirements or is not timely submitted will be rejected and will not be included in the official record of the meeting. As we gain more experience, the city may adjust these procedures. For today's meeting, my opinion is that these measures satisfy all applicable legal requirements. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you City Attorney. All righty, at this time, um, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda, but I do believe City Manager, you had a request. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I was wondering if, um, so due to the fact of our remote meeting and some double bookings and the urgency to get this item forward, if we could move item, uh, let's see what number is this, 5D resolution number 2020R-16 um, as early in the meeting as possible because our bond council who may or may not be needed for any questions for this, unfortunately has another event as well booked tonight. So if we could do that, that would be great. 
You want to move it right after announcements, which is 3A and right before consent? That would be perfect. Okay. Uh, will they be prepared to start that early in the meeting? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you, City uh, Manager. I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda with the City Manager's request. If so I'll so move. I heard uh, a motion Second. by. I heard a motion by Commissioner Hanks to approve the agenda as presented, moving item 5D to after 3A, and that was seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Did I capture that correctly, Commissioner Hanks? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. All right, since we are doing, vo uh, doing virtual meetings, I do need to take all votes by voice. So the motion maker was Commissioner Hanks. Your vote? Yes, or aye. Thank you, Commissioner Emrich as the seconder. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Carousel. Yes. Thank you, and Vice Mayor Luke. Yes. And myself, a yes. So that was approved. Um, do we have any general public comment, City Manager or Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No public comment. Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, announcement, City Clerk. Current vacancies for the following boards and committees include the Art Advisory Board, Audit Committee, Beautification Entry, Scenic Highway Committee, Charter Review Advisory Board, Citizens Tax Oversight Committee, Community Economic Development Advisory Board, Environmental Advisory Board, Historic and Cultural Advisory Board, Joint Management Advisory Board, Police Officers Pension Board of Trustees, Northport Youth Council, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, Public Utility Advisory Board, Zoning Board of Appeals. The upcoming expirations for the following advisory boards and committees are Advisory Board, Community Economic Development Advisory Board, Environmental Advisory Board, Historic and Cultural Advisory Board, Northport Youth Council, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, and Planning and Zoning Advisory Board. One Northport resident to serve on the Sarasota Manatee Metropolitan Planning Organization Citizens Advisory Network. If anyone would like more information, please see the City Clerk's Office. Thank you. Thank you very much, City Clerk. And um, I guess we'll move on to item 5D, which is the truest, I think I'm saying the name of that right, truest bank. Um, so for resolution number 2020R-16. So I'll turn that over to City Manager, please. As it's a resolution, does the clerk need to read yes. the title? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. City Clerk, could you please read that by title only? Resolution number 2020-R-16, accepting a proposal of Truist Bank to provide the city with a loan in order to refund a portion of the city's outstanding transportation improvement assessment bonds, series 2013. Thank you. All these papers I have to juggle and I missed that one, sorry. Right? <laughs> all right, so We're all city here. manager. Thank you, go ahead, please. All right. So um, this relates to a refinancing of our road bond. As you know, back in 2013, the voters approved a road bond to redo the, the roads in the city. It was approximately $43 million at the time. Um, subsequent to that, earlier this year, the city hired a new financial advisor, PFM. And one of the very first things that they did was look at our outstanding debt and to see if there was a way that we could get better interest rates to save the taxpayers money. And this being the largest single debt that the city has in any form um, was a prime category for that. It's also the only bond that we have outstanding. Everything else are bank loans, which is what this would be if this item gets approved also. Um, the, so the, this is a refinancing of that road bond that will ultimately have a net present value, which means today's dollars savings of $1,570,000 to the taxpayers after all costs of, for refinancing are factored in. It will also cut off the last two years of assessments. So instead of this being an up to a 26 year, now it's up to a 24 year. And it also has the potential to be refinanced again due to the current tax law in 2023, which could save the taxpayers, make that 1,570 go up to $3 million savings, but we can't promise that until 2023. So we won't know depending what the, the market rates are then. But the million five seventy is a current savings now, um, and that is realized. So, um, with that, 
I know this is a complicated document. I know there's a lot of details. I'm not going to go into all of the financial details because I don't think that it's something that's easily explained. And you just, if you have any questions, I'm here. Our bond counsel is here. The city attorney who also helped on this, as well as our financial advisor are all on the, on the call. Thank you very much, city manager. All right, I do not see any hands up. Does anybody have any questions on this item before us? Seeing none, I do have a couple that I need to get clarified. Um, in exhibit B, it says about the loan agreement and I'm talking about it's on page seven and it's in the definitions. And it says that non ad valorem revenues shall mean all governmental re fund revenues other than ad valorem, but only to the extent that they're legally available. What, what does that mean? So, is it only the road so, bond money or is it all non ad valorem funds that are available? Steve Miller, if you see, he's just highlighted him, he's now into the meeting. He is the Thank bond you. counsel. I'm going to let him give his first shot at that. Sounds Thank good. You. Thanks, Pete. And thank you all for accommodating the move and the agenda item. I appreciate it. Um, the, uh, the original deal in 2013 um, was a bond deal, a publicly offered bond deal, where all of those assessment uh, proceeds were pledged as a security and a specific lien on those revenues. Because that security is not considered to be a great um, security in the marketplace, at the time that we did those 2013 bonds, it was also, also supported by what we call a covenant to budget and appropriate legally available non loan revenues. And that's just a fancy way of saying if the assessments had not been sufficient, that you guys each year during your budget process would find some legally available non loan revenues without identifying any particular ones to pay for the debt. When this refunding opportunity came along and we decided to do it as a bank loan, and that was the recommendation of your financial advisor, it was decided that it would be a simpler transaction for the banks to understand if the assessments, the specific pledge of the assessments was taken out of the security specifically, and we just did the covenant to budget and appropriate. So that's how this is structured. And what it does mean is each year, the city is supposed to budget and appropriate sufficient any non avalon revenue that's legally available to pay the debt. You're not pledging them as security, but you're saying you'll use them. The intent, however, by the city is to use the assessments and they should be sufficient. But this just gives you a better credit quality to get you a lower interest rate and more savings. So does that mean that the fire district or solid waste could possibly pay this? No, ma'am. No, no, the solid waste, because they're not part of the governmental funds, they're an enterprise fund, and the other ones wouldn't be legally available. So it would be like sales taxes or revenue sharing or something if the assessments turned out to not be sufficient enough to service the debt. But the intent is to use those assessments, which have been sufficient to date. So we're basically still going to be collecting the road bond, what is it, $46, whatever, from every property owner, generally. And if that's that, what's going to be paying it? Absolutely. This is just a mechanism to have given a better security for the credit so you guys can get a better interest rate, something that the okay. banks would understand. Fantastic. Um, I appreciate that explanation. I, I know I've been hounding the staff to try and get a, my head wrapped around it. And I think it was the third time was a charm. So thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, <laughs> in the resolution, there's references to exhibits and they're not matching up. Uh -oh. And I just want to make sure that my copy is what's incorrect, but the actual resolution is is right. Okay. Um, if you look at X, if you look at re, in the resolution 7.03, it says attached to the loan agreement as Exhibit A. The loan agreement is outlined in the definitions as Exhibit B. Yep, you are right. The the Exhibit A should be the proposal of Truist. Uh, exhibit B is the loan agreement, exhibit C is the Ford purchase agreement, and exhibit D is the escrow deposit agreement. Right. So, so Mayor McDowell, if I may, in that section, um, it does not refer to 
that document as Exhibit A. It's saying substantially in the form that's attached to the loan agreement as Exhibit uh -huh. A. So it's referring to Exhibit A of the agreement, not Exhibit A of the resolution. Well, it's kind of confusing then. Should we take that Exhibit A out? Because if uh, it's in the loan agreement, it's exhibit A to exhibit B, the city attorney is correct. Okay. Um, yeah. And because the loan agreement itself um, contains the, the terms of the actual note that'll be issued. So the form of the note is attached to that loan agreement. Yes, ma'am. And then if you look at section 6.01, it very clearly identifies um, what is attached as exhibit A and incorporated therein with respect to exhibit A to the resolution. Right. Okay. All right. So maybe the same thing applies and bear with me. Um, when I go to section 8.03, it says here by the forward purchase agreement, which will be substantially in the form attached to as exhibit B, the forward purchase agreement is exhibit C. Is it the same concept as what we just talked about in 8.0? Um, in uh, 7.02? No, you actually got us on that one. That should be exhibit C in 803. If you'd like, Mayor, um, because if the exhibit references are inaccurate, those are Scrivener's errors. If you'd like, we can just review and double check the exhibit numbers before um, we execute the resolution. Assuming that the board uh, adopts it, we can do that as a Scrivener's error. Okay. It's a good catch. All right, and that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody's ready? I'll entertain a motion, please. I'll move to approve resolution number 2020-R-6, uh, correcting the Scribner's errors before signing. Second. And Vice Mayor, could you please restate the motion because I think you misread the resolution number. Could you please restate the motion? 2020-R-16. Thank you. Thank you. Bill a second. Thank you very much. I got a motion on the floor to approve resolution number 2020-R-16 by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Hanks. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? I just want to thank the company, the, the new people for finding this. This is a great find. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Commissioner Hanks. Yeah, this is exactly the things that we're supposed to be doing. You know, it's uh, this is uh, being very responsible with the uh, with the financial standing that we're in and and, uh, you know, the monies that we have to deal with that belong to the taxpayers and I greatly appreciate uh, uh, you, Mr. Miller, and I appreciate uh, all of our staff that have uh, taken the time to uh, do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other hands raised, I will also say thank you. Thank you to staff for bearing with me while I tried to understand um, this. And I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Miller and definitely appreciate the savings that our taxpayers are going to be finding as this loan is going to be shrunk instead of being paid for the whole full term. So one point, what is it? $1.7 million right now is a lot of money. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and call the question. And Commissioner, uh, Vice Mayor Luke, as the motion maker? Yes. As a seconder, Commissioner Hanks. You what, ma'am? You broke up a little Your bit. Your vote? Oh, Your yes. Your vote, please. Yes. Was that a yes? Yes, ma'am. You broke up a little bit there. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Emrich? Yes. Thank you. And Commissioner Carousel? Yes. Thank you. And myself, a yes. So that passes unanimously. And thank you very much, everybody. All right. So now we will move on to consent agenda. City Manager, was anything pulled from consent agenda? No, ma'am. Did we have public comment for that last item? No, ma'am. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, I'm watching it, <laughs> but no, there was no public thank comment. You. <laughs> not, not on my end either. At this point, thank I don't you. have any public comment for anything. Say nothing. 
Okay. Um, so we're on to consent now. Do we have any um, anything to be pulled from consent? No, ma'am. Thank you. I'll move, to, I'll move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you very much. And hearing that there was no public comment, I need a second to approve that motion. I'll second. Thank you. Got a motion on the floor to approve the consent agenda as presented by Vice Mayor and seconded by Commissioner Emrich. Anything to any of the items on consent? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and take the voice vote. Uh, Vice Mayor Luke. Yes. Commissioner Emrich. Yes. Commissioner Carousel. Yes. Commissioner Hanks. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. And I too am a yes. So that passed unanimously. All right, so now we're on to the second reading for ordinance number 2019-46, which is the West Villages pattern book. City Clerk, could you please read that by title only? Ordinance number 2019-46, an ordinance of the city of Northport, Florida, adopting the West Villages Village District pattern book for approximately 8,000 acres in the village future land use, providing for findings, providing for adoption, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you very much, city manager. Thank you, mayor. Back on March 25th, I believe it was, we had the first reading of this. This was the updated um, West Villages pattern book. And you know, that was that meeting consisted of all West Villages items. This was one of the ones that was remaining because it has a second reading. Um, there were counting 31 changes that were suggested at that meeting. All of them have been made. Um, and some minor grammar and formatting corrections were also done without affecting anything of substance. But staff is here since it's the second reading, we're not gonna do a presentation unless you have any questions for us. So we're ready for when, for when you are. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions on this uh, pattern book? Seeing no hands raised, I just have four little ones. Um, uh, if you go to page 12 of the book, it says um, that this is talking about the committee and having a um, staff member, city staff member sitting on the West Villages Review Committee. It says here that the city of Northport shall have one individual advisory or non-voting member. And I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around how we can have one individual <coughs> advisory or a non-voting member. Sorry, I was trying to un unmute myself. And we could certainly change that to just an advisory member if that's what you, it would make it easier to understand. Well, I thought it was uh, an individual advisory that it doesn't have any voting rights. I thought that that was, it was like an, I think the word was used as ex officio. Yes, ma'am, it would be a non-voting member. That is the plan is the, the person wouldn't have a vote. They'd be there um, in an advisory capaci capacity. Um, I don't remember if the term was used ex officio or not. It's very possible. I just don't remember. Um, Ms. Gail House, who's our planning division manager is here as well. And she has her, her hand up as does John Lazinski and Katie Labar, they're both here um, as well. So I will let one of them answer this question for you. Thank you so much. Just state your name for the record, whoever is going to be the answerer. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. Katie Labar here with Stantec. Um, as uh, Mr. Lear stated, uh, in order to just make the link, make it very clear that the individual who would sit on this com on this committee is indeed a non-voting member the the thought was to state it as an advisory or non-voting member um, i believe that the sentence reads clear um, if it's the pleasure of the board that we modify uh, we're happy to do so before it's ultimately approved um, but as i said the, the way that the sentence reads in its entirety i think that it makes the point very clearly Did Ms. Galehouse want to weigh in? Um, for the record, Nicole Galehouse, Planning Division Manager. Um, I would agree with um, the consultant. I don't have an issue if we were to remove either one, um, but if 
they want to leave it as well, I think it reads fine. Okay. Um, so on page 39, this is all new language. Um, and I'm, it's, it says that um, it's in the town center. And I know we had a lot of discussion about town center and we were talking about incentives and it's, it says here an expedited permit review um, a, as a possible incentive. What exactly is that mean? So uh, this is Nicole Galehouse again for the record. Um, this is not a practice we currently have and um, the inclusion of this language on page 39 would not automatically give an expedited permit review um, option to the West Villages, but it contemplates the creation of a, a program to allow for this, not only within the West Villages, but within other areas of the city where we want to incentivize development. Um, and so it's something that we would like to look into and um, develop a process for and allow for the use of it within the town center to encourage non-residential development. But if we don't have this expedited permit review process in place, and it's probably going to take a while for it to become into place, probably well over six months to a year, why would we put it in here if it doesn't exist? What it says is it should be considered. It doesn't say it has to happen. The very end of it, it says it's, it's right. six months in other communities and it should be considered for the West Villages. So. We will consider it. We're going to try and figure out a way to make it happen, but we accomplish what's in here by considering it. Okay. Semantics. <laughs> um, <important. laughs> yeah. So I know that we took the town, uh, the index map out of this document, um, but it is mentioned throughout the document and it's referenced throughout the document but it doesn't show or tell anybody where to find this index map. And I'm wondering, should that be stated somewhere? Um, this is Nicole Gailhouse. Um, for this one, um, I don't think it would hurt to put a reference um, into the pattern book for it, but it is also um, the history of the index map is included in the whereas clauses of the ordinance that adopts the pattern book. And both documents mm -hmm. will be, um, on the city's planning and zoning website. So they'll be available together um, when you search our website. Sounds good. Do you, do you think maybe another good spot inside this document itself might be under the definitions? That way then we can incorporate it that it's like amended or changed or whatever from time to time? We could certainly make that change, yes. All right, um, my last one has, and I know I met with you, Miss Nicole, about this, uh, about the frontage yard. And I, I went back and looked at it after we met and then seeing the actual document. Um, if you go to page 65, it says the frontage yard shall include two canopy trees, blah, 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 blah. But when you go to pages 20 through 27, it says May may provide public frontage plantings containing trees and may um trying to find another one here and and um if these frontage are supposed are shall include them why are we still saying may and and i know that you tried to explain that sometimes the frontage yard doesn't have a place for the trees but if you're saying that it shall include them, why is it still May? Uh, so uh, again, this is Nicole, um, the, it, the, I think we're mixing up a few different things here. So it's not that it may not have the trees, it's that the road may not have the frontage yard, but when it does have the frontage yard, the frontage yard shall contain those number of trees. And so I think what we discussed is that um, the best place to kind of really implement and enforce this is at the VDPP level, where we have a little more specificity in the design of the, of the village and can really get into that level of detail, where at the pattern book stage, we're still talking broadly for things that can apply to the entire um, improvement district. But doesn't the pattern book 
have precedent over the pattern plan? The pattern plan can be more specific. Gotcha. All right. That, I believe, is all I have. Yep, that's all I've got. Thank you so much. I don't, oh, I do see uh, Vice Mayor's hand is up. Go ahead, please, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to touch on two of the things that you brought up. We did discuss ex officio. We used that terminology in the last meeting, but to my knowledge, that is what they've got written is what an ex officio is. Uh, so I don't mind it being written either way. And I like uh, anything that deals with enticements. Uh, I think that's a, a good measure for the city to have. It's a positive rather than a negative. So I like leaving the development uh, being expedited in there and then having them develop that so that it can be utilized as a tool in the toolbox by neighborhood development. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I don't see anybody else's hand up. So if anybody would like to go ahead and make a motion, please raise your hand so I know who wants to make a motion. Otherwise I'll pass the gavel. I'll move to approve ordinance number 2019-46 as presented. Second. I have a motion on the floor approving uh, the West Village's pattern book, ordinance number 2019-46 as presented by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Hanks. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. Anything to that, Commissioner Hanks? No, ma'am. Alrighty, I don't see anybody else's hand up, but um, staff and the consultant had said that they would be amenable to adding about the, um, the, the uh, index map either in the um, definitions or notated somewhere in the document itself. Um, would anybody like to make an amendment to that or do you want me to pass the gavel? I'm actually fine with the way that it was presented. I think if it was necessary, it would have already been put into it. So I'm fine with it being mentioned in the whereas as personally myself. I agree with the vice mayor, I'm fine. But the whereas is aren't part of the actual document. And the document is going to be used far more than the language in the ordinance. Is that correct, city attorney or Miss Nicole? Um, so this is this is Nicole. Um the it the document is used more frequently than the ordinance, but generally speaking, the ordinance number is on the front of the documents. That's one of the changes that's made upon adoption. So Ms. Nicole, are you and Ms. Labar, who's representing West Villages, are you comfortable with not having any reference in the actual document about where the index map is? Uh, from planning, yes, I, I'm comfortable with that. Rep okay. This is Katie, Katie Labar, I am too. All right, thank you very much. Seeing nobody else's hand up, we'll go ahead and take the vote. Yes. And start with the uh, vice mayor is the motion maker. Yeah, I heard a yes. yes. Uh, seconder, Commissioner Hanks. Yes. Commissioner Carrasco. Yes. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. And myself, I'm a yes. Thank you very much. That passed five to zero. All righty. So now we're going to move on to the first reading of ordinance number 2020-20. And that is the uh, uh, amendment to the budget for fiscal year 1920. Um, I need a motion to read that by title only, please. So moved. Second. Got a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Luke and seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Go ahead and take the voice vote, uh, Vice Mayor. Yes. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. Commissioner Carrison. Commissioner Carrison. Commissioner Carrison, could you please unmute? Yeah. Ah. 
Thank you. What? Yeah. Did you just run a marathon or something? <laughs> and Commissioner Hanks. Yes. And myself, a yes. Uh, City Clerk, could you please read that by title only? Ordinance number 2020-20, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the non-district budget for fiscal year 2019-20 by transferring $2,860,218 from the park impact fee fund balance, $24,842 from the fire rescue impact fee fund balance, and $85,947 from the law enforcement impact fee fund balance, and increasing the estimated revenues for the park impact fee fund for reimbursement of costs as outlined in the West Village's developer agreement post annexation, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you very much, city clerk, city manager. Thank you, mayor. Um, back at that same meeting that we just referenced for the last item on March 25th, um, a developer's agreement was approved. There were a bunch of provisions in that agreement. It was rather large, um, but some of them required reimbursements for things that the developer and the district have done over the years and will do over the years. Um, those reimbursements are coming from impact feeds of a variety of sources. Some of them are parks, some of them are fire, law enforcement. Um, depends on what they've spent money on and what they're being reimbursed for. But they are to be reimbursed. Some of them have a very short turnaround time, which is why you have this in front of you today. Um, but this will amend the budget to reimburse for the impact fees we have collected to date up in the West Villages. This is the only impact fees collected up there that they get reimbursed from. So these are all to be in compliance with the agreement that was adopted back on March 25th. Thank you, city manager. Does anybody have any questions? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve ordinance number 2020-20. Second. A motion on the floor by Commissioner Hanks to approve ordinance number 2020-20. And that was first reading. Oh, we have to continue at a second reading. Continue to second continue reading. To... Sorry, you're right. And do on May 12th. And... Thank you. I, I don't know for sure we're having meetings on those dates. Right. So it's already been noticed for that date. Thank right. you. Do you want to go ahead and just restate Commissioner Hanks? Yeah, I'll I'll uh, move to uh, to a bring ordinance number 2020-20 to second reading. On May 12th. Yeah, that's already given according to our ordinances. Commissioner Emmerich, and you're seconding that? I'll give it a whirl, yes, second. All right. Anything to that, Commissioner Hanks? No, ma'am. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Commissioner Luke, I do see your hand up, so go ahead, please. Yeah, just a comment is, I mean, there's there's nothing to be done about this. This is what was put in place in, in the original agreements and stuff, and we have to abide by this. But that amount of money for that 63-acre park is just unreal to me. It looks like they've gone in and did some initial planning a couple of times and I hope this is uh, a lesson to be learned that we don't go so far out in front of ourselves with these types of plans that we spend that kind of money and then end up changing it in the end. So just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Seeing nothing else, we'll go ahead and do voice vote. Uh, Commissioner Hanks as the motion maker, please. Yes. Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. Commissioner Carrison. Yes. Uh, Vice Mayor. Yes. And myself a yes. And that passed uh, unanimously. We'll be back on May 12th for second reading. All right. So now we have uh, ordinance number 2020-21, which is um, re about the maintenance of the stormwater drainage. Um, I need a motion to read by title only, please. So moved. Second. Motion on the floor to read by title only by Vice Mayor Luke, seconded by Commissioner Hanks. We'll go ahead and take voice vote. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Commissioner Emmerich? Yes, Emmerich? sorry. 
I was That's muted. Right. Sorry. Commissioner Carasone. Yes. And myself, a yes. City Clerk, could you please read by title only? Ordinance number 2020-21, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the code of the City of Northport, Florida, section 42-24. Maintenance of stormwater drainage area, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. All right. Uh, Vice Mayor, I see your hand up. Thank you, City Clerk. Thank you. Uh, to give you a heads up, I've had a conversation with uh, Julie Belia uh, because I had a I had a big problem and concern with, with this ordinance. Uh, the reason that I did was the wording that was especially stated within the whereases. And it looked as though there had been no change to the methodology. And we went through a change of methodology just last year. And we have finally made the stormwater system uh, a, a system. I mean, we have a plan and the uh, road and drainage is over taking care of the stormwater, though the residents, you know, supplement what they're doing. They have a certain amount of um, cuts and, drain, you know, digging out and stuff like that that they do. And then in between time in those swales, the resident is knocking down, you know, 12 inches or lower. I mean, that's why we had this ordinance so that they're not out there trying to do it or mandatory to do it during the wet season. So I had a really big issue with the way it was worded because it looked like it was all the responsibility of the residents and we actually changed that type of methodology. So with that, uh, and I'm sure Julie will speak to that if you'd like her to, um, I'm wondering, have we even updated chapter 4224 uh, uh, in the ULDC so that it's up to date with our new methodology? Or are we putting this off for the new revised ULDC? City manager. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have, uh, you see, Ms. Belia is on here. She can probably answer that question better than I can. So if, I'll let her go ahead with that since you guys have already had a conversation on it. For the record, Juliana Belia, Public Works Director. Um, right now, Vice Mayor, we have only uh, made the changes with, with respect to the issue at hand. We most certainly will We'll go back as we do periodically and update it to, to reflect everything um, that the road drainage is, district is responsible for. Um, primarily on section 42-24, maintenance of the stormwater drainage area, um, it's, it's primarily talking about the property owner's responsibility, but we can most certainly go in there and um, update this to reflect what the methodology um, now requires and how we have changed how we conduct our maintenance and operations of the stormwater drainage swale. Um, in the meantime, and I believe I made this uh, suggestion to you that in order to make it clear in ordinance 2020-21, perhaps we could add uh, two new whereas clauses and if I may, uh, they're not very long. I could just kind of uh, put them on the record. The first new one would be in the very beginning, whereas the city of Northport Roan Drainage District is responsible for the maintenance and operations of the city, city's stormwater drainage system, semicolon and, whereas the Roan Drainage District mows the banks of all swales along local roads six times per year, and the centers of all swales two times per year, period. In addition, the road and drainage district mows the banks of all swales along all our arterial and collector roads eight times per year, and the centers of all swales two times per year, semicolon and. And this would go, these two new whereas clauses would go before the first uh, whereas clause, which 
talks about the property owner, what their responsibility is. And that way it's clear at the onset what the district does, and then it gets into what the property owner is responsible for. City Manager. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Julie. Uh, I am going to cease from any further discussion until the rest of the commission is allowed to discuss. So I'm going to pass my time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions on this item? Seeing nobody has their hands raised. Um, Ms. Belia, our City Manager, I have a couple questions because I have a really hard time with this for some of the reasons that Vice Mayor has already brought up. Could you please tell me generally, when about do you do the six times a year mowing in the neighborhoods? What months do you usually do that? I don't do it at all, but I'll let Ms. Belia, because her staff, <laughs> she can answer. I, I do it for one house. Um, <laughs> I heard you don't do that either. <laughs> I make sure it's done for one house. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Ms. Valia? Okay. T typically, um, we're going to do it. Definitely, we're going to do a cut in the spring and a cut in the, in the fall, in the winter months, as far as, as the regular mowing cuts. And that would also be the times in the dry seasons that we would do the centers of the, of the swales, the two times per year. And that'll be the same for local roads as well as the arterials and collectors. Uh, the six times per year, it, it, you're gonna have probably starting in the spring and mostly through the summer, you, you know what I mean? Um, in the summer months, it's probably gonna be once a month, definitely. So there's gonna be three times right there. Your two spring and fall and possibly four times during the summer. So I'd say four times during the summer, one in the spring, one in the fall. And that of course, the eight times will be probably gonna go into your summer months when we have the heaviest amount of rainfall uh, for your arterials and collectors. Now, what we have done is tried to be very uh, realistic on the side of when is the homeowner responsible for cutting the center to maintain that 12 inches. Um, and Mr. Speak, the operations manager and myself feel very strongly that we don't want the, to be, be so strict and tell the homeowner, as soon as it gets 12 inches, you got to cut it and we don't care how wet it is. We're fully cognizant of the, of the fact that that's the worst thing we could do because although it looks nice, um, you can't have somebody going in and um, ruining their equipment, nor can you, do we want to encourage ruining of the swells and disrupting the drainage. So what we have done is we've designed the ordinance to, once the swell dries out, the homeowner has 30 days in which they can cut that swell or use a weed eater. Because if we make him get in there and cut it, he or she get in there and cut it too soon, now we're writing up the swell, or they are, and now we're gonna to have to go in the road and drainage district, Department of Public Works, and we're gonna to have to regrade the drainage swell. And we don't want that. Honestly, a little bit of grass is not gonna hurt anything as far as the as the drainage. And it's it's gonna actually help, you know, um, with the pollutants and things like that. It gives a little bit of a treatment. Keeping in mind that now that we're doing this program, we've got it much more under control. So we don't have it to where three, four feet height of vegetation, trees, like in the estates, we're gonna have all that down to a manageable level. So we think we're being very fair with not only for the homeowner on their side, but also the city's side and on maintaining it for the hydraulic function for the drainage. Thank you, Ms. Valia. You also, the great segue for my next question, because okay. you said that it's maintained by the homeowner, but are they vacant property owners required to maintain theirs too? Yes, ma'am. In between, in between when we get in there, we're gonna cut it six for both. 
So in between, make it yes, ma'am. We'll responsible. You are correct. I had to think about that since this is all changed. Sorry. Thank you. So vacant and improved property owners are responsible um, for the in between times of the six slash eight, and then the other two. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Did we already hire staff? I know that we, during budget time when, and during the methodology talks, we talked about having to hire staff to supplement this new level of service. Have we already hired the staff? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, I have no further questions on this. I do have a couple comments, but anybody else have any questions? Uh, Vice Mayor? Thank you. Uh, this question is to Ms. Julie. Uh, I like the first two whereas that you have setting them as the first and the second within the ordinance. Uh, I'm wondering if you can take a look at what would be the third one, which is on the first. And wondering if um, it makes any sense to say section 42-24 of the code of the city of Northport, Florida requires property owners to, and then if we could put in to aid in the maintenance of the drainage system, comma, at their own expense and then throughout the rest of the whereas, because it shows them that they have a duty uh, to aid you. I mean, you're the primary, but then they have that duty to aid in the supplement. I'm wondering your thoughts on that. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with it, except I would recommend the word stormwater before drainage. So if, if I can just uh, make sure I, I have it correctly, to aid in the maintenance of the stormwater drainage system. Yes, ma'am. At, at their own expense, okay. Yes, ma'am. I think it helps mm -hmm. with what will be the new ULDC code. Uh, I think it kind of plays into it before even the rewrite and the changes come into effect. City attorney, does everything sound all right to you in that suggestion? I'll take a look at it before a second reading. Thank you, ma'am. Whereas clauses are not codified. So just because it says all this in the whereas clauses, how does that help the actual ordinance? and the actual code. If, if I may, uh, two, two things. One, um, as, as was pointed out in the beginning, the language in 4224 has not, the methodology, the current methodology has not been incorporated to that. So once we do that, then we will have it in the meat of the ordinance that it's clear as, as far as what the city does versus what the property owner is, is required to do. So by putting it in the whereas clause here, because now we are clarifying um, ex exactly when and how the property owner is required to ma maintain their swale, it's just a little bit of clarification language. And then we're going to need to follow up to put it in the, the body of the 4224 about the city's role and everything. You know what I'm saying? It just clarifies it for the action we're taking now. And then when we go later on and incorporate the methodology language in there, it'll be clear what the city does versus what the uh, property owner is required to do. So help me understand, why can't we just do it all at one time in this ordinance? I we mean, if we're, gonna hold, we if we're gonna hold our citizens and our property owners to this standard of maintaining it in between the city maintaining it, why wouldn't we put it, if it says that the city's responsibility is, and it's already there what your responsibilities are, why wouldn't we want to then incorporate what the methodology is that we have already adopted at the same time? 
Mayor, if that is the will of the board, you could do that in this ordinance. This ordinance is amending section 42-24 and the title right. block that's being advertised is written broadly enough that it would support that. For second reading, we have to take a look at the language, um, you know, make sure that it fits with the rest of the code and, and that it makes sense. But whatever, you know, whatever changes the board has that are specific or even general in nature, if they are revisions to amendments to section 42-24, which relates to the maintenance of stormwater drainage area, it can be accomplished in this ordinance, at least legally speaking. Thank you, city attorney. All right. If, if I can make a suggestion, I, I would prefer to do it a different way. I would rather not piecemeal it with just this one part of it. I would read, because I know we were trying to um, address an issue with respect to the centers of the swale. I would rather go back to the entire section and look at the entire methodology and anything else I need to incorporate, I would rather do it all at one time. You know what I mean? Otherwise, we're just piecemealing. All we're doing is taking a small part of the methodology and incorporating it into this ordinance. When we were just merely for now trying to address the set maintenance of the centers of the swale and provide relief to homeowners and be more realistic about the enforcement with the conditions of the, of the land and because they're so wet during the summers. And Mayor, if I may follow up on, Ms., on what Ms. Belia said, it appears that the ordinance in front of you has a lot of changes to it. Um, what you really see here is a lot of cleanup and mm -hmm. really the only <laughs> substantive change is at the very end, which right. allows the homeowners an exception while their swale is wet. So, so Ms. Bilia is right. This, this, the actual substantive part of the amendment here is, is minor compared to the overall section. Thank you. Alrighty, see no other questions. Just double checking, do we have any public comment, city manager or vice mayor? No, ma'am. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion, please. Um, move to approve ordinance number 2020-21, adding within the whereas clause, the two whereas sections that was stated by Ms. Belia, su suggested and added by her, and then to the new third whereas, adding uh, it the word to, to aid in the maintenance of the storm water system, comma, being reviewed by the city attorney for the language before being brought back for second reading, so this would be continued to May 12th. Thank you. Before I get a second on that, City Attorney and Ms. Valia, is that going to give you enough time to get the documents all completed for the second reading in two weeks? From our perspective, if the changes are, are that minor, that would be the case. If ultimately the board adopts changes that are that are more broad, we might need longer. Okay, but the, the two whereas clauses and the change to the, the other whereas clause that Vice Mayor was talking about will give you enough time to get it done by May 12th. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. All right, so I have a motion on the floor as stated by Vice Mayor, I need, I need a second. Second. Yeah. So I got a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor as stated, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? I think it clarifies through the whereas is what the methodology, the changes that the methodology did so that they're clear in who's responsible for the entire system and what portion uh, that they're required to do and then the time frame where they don't have to do it is what the thrust of this is. So thank you very much. And Commissioner Emmerich, anything to the motion? No, ma'am. All right, does anybody else wanna make any comments about the motion or anything? I'm going to state for the record, I am not going to be supporting this motion. Um, I have a serious problem 
when we raised our taxpayers' assessments, increased the level of service, and now we are also going to be holding them accountable in between the city's responsibilities. Um, I think if we're going to take uh, these responsibilities on, we just take them on. I can't see fining our citizens or holding them for code enforcement in between these times that the city is supposed to be mowing. Most property owners um, the, on the improved properties already maintain theirs. Um, I, I just cannot support this. So with that said, seeing no lights on, we'll go ahead and take the vote. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yes. yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Carasone? No. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. And myself, I also say no. So we have a passing um, of, ordin of moving this to second reading, and that vote was three to two with McDowell and Carasone dissenting. And Commissioner Carasone, did you want to state a reason for your dissension? Well, first, you know how I love code enforcement. But second of all, you know, that was kind of what I thought when we talked about raising the road and drainage rates, it was for the extra additional services. Now, I understand that, you know, that there should be some um, code enforcement and some violations when it's, I, I just, you know, this one's really hard for me because I think that if you take pride in your own front yard, uh, you're going to take pride. If you're not, you're not going to do it. And then it's just more expenditures for the city. And quite honestly, it just to me seems like it's been a money maker for a long time. And um, enough is enough. Uh, residents just can't be taxed anymore. Bottom line. Yeah. And this was only for road and for the right of way. They still have to, this is for only the right of way, not for their whole yard. So I can see why the rest of their yard has to be maintained and we can't have, you know, three feet of grass growing outside of the right of way. But all right. So um, I see city manager, you have your hand up. I can't hear you, sir. You need to unmute, please. Could you please unmute? Um, no, but after you finish this item, but before you jump to the next one, I'd like to, I need you to do something if you could. So Me? Over, the commission as a whole. Okay. Um, yeah, so at this time, we're gonna be moving on to impact fees and deferral discussion and possible action. So city manager, what would you like to so say? Back on the last item, the budget amendment for ordinance number 2020-20, the actual motion what was stated was to continue the second reading to May 12th, but it's actually in the staff summary to be to May 7th, which is what we need it to be because the developer agreement gave us 45 days to make those payments and May 12th will take us beyond that. So I need to um, restate that motion to have it come to you on May 7th, not May 12th. Okay, can I get, we need to reconsider that item. Can I get a motion to reconsider the item 2020-20, that ordinance number? So moved. We need to do a voice vote to reconsider ordinance number 2020-20. Uh, Commissioner Luke? Yes. Commissioner Hanks? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. Commissioner Carason? Yes. And I'm a yes. All righty, so we are going to reconsider that ordinance number and city manager, you said you need it to state that it's going to be read on May 7th. Yes, ma'am. Now, the big question of the day is, how was it publicly noticed? May 7th. May 7th? Okay, yes. thank you. Does anybody have any questions to city manager? Otherwise, I'll go ahead and entertain a motion. Commissioner Hanks was the one that made the motion. Can he just change the date? I think 
we probably we have to need make to, a new motion, I think. Yeah, we'll have to make a new motion because we voted on that one. We reconsidered it. Let's let's just do a whole new motion. Commissioner Hank, since you were the initial motion maker, do you want to redo it and make a new motion? Well, I, you know, we already had that. So, I, you know, my motion would include or would uh, get rid of the 12th and uh, put it on. Okay. And I don't remember who the seconder was. I think it was Commissioner Emmerich. Does he need to? City I'll clerk, since you're a it, does, it needs to be the, a new motion with a, a whole new motion. That's what yes. I thought. So Commissioner Hanks, if you could please make a whole new motion or somebody make a whole new motion. I move, uh, to, I move to continue ordinance number 2020-20 for second reading on May 7th. Second. And, and I got a second. Okay, so I got a motion on the floor to approve, to move ordinance number 2020-20 to May 7th, second reading that was made by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Carasone. We'll go ahead and do voice vote unless somebody wants to quickly raise their hand. Let's do voice vote, uh, Vice Mayor. Yes. Commissioner Carasone. Hey, it wasn't me that seconded, just an FYI. But yes. Who, who seconded <laughs> it then? I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't tell because nobody has their pictures up. So who's, who's actually speaking? Commissioner Emmerich seconded it. Thank you. Commissioner Emmerich, as a seconder, what is your vote, please? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Carrison. Commissioner Carrison, could you please unmute and give your vote? Yes, already. Sorry. Thank you, Commissioner Hanks. Yes. Thank you. And I'm also a yes. All right, guys, that passed uh, five to zero for May 7th. And thank you, uh, city manager, for bringing that to our attention. All right, so now it is seven o'clock and we are moving on to discussion and possible action regarding the impact fees, deferrals, and waivers. <clears throat> city manager, I believe this one's yours. Yes, ma'am, thank you, Mayor. I, we do have staff here to answer any questions that you may have, but we've had a couple conversations on providing either deferrals or waivers of impact fees. Um, the last one being in November of 2019, where we had a workshop, um, we presented you all with some information, you asked for some additional information, which we are, are bringing back um, more information was regarding the stacking of the deferrals to existing businesses. Um, both our economic development and our planning staff have done a lot of work on this, and they are both here to answer any questions. So with that, I'll just see what you have for questions on this, or if you'd like to see if, if you'd like to hear from them first, we can do that too. Okay. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask of staff regarding the subject matter? No, ma'am. Commissioner Luke, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Luke. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask staff, well, first of all, tell staff that I think they did a great job with this, uh, utilizing the platform that the county uses. I think it was great. But the question that I have for them is the spinoff to the actual 10-year, uh, looking at the 10-year scope, uh, that is for the varying different categories is the first question. Is that correct? And then is that affected um, because of their wage or their salary, does that come into compliance or come into you know, the thought on it? So wondering if it's calculated, the spinoff is calculated by the varying categories or the salary or both. Thank you. So I have uh, Ms. Gale House is here. She can, she'll try to address those questions first. And so is Mel Thomas, our economic development manager. Um, thank you for, for the record. This is Nicole Gale House, planning division manager. When you say spinoff, can you point me to what you're referring to in regards to that?
Ms. Vice Mayor, you need to unmute, please. <laughs> uh, there is a chart that talks about the, you know, going out 10 years. And I'm trying to find the chart right now. I did not mark it down, but it talks about um, the, you know, the actual, and then it talks about a spinoff. So I was wondering if the spinoff was varied or if it does vary because of the type of business or slash and because of the amount of salary. So Mel, Mel can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe the answer is yes. In order to develop um, these models with this software, um, you have to put in all, all the specifics of each individual business that you would be evaluating and what their economic impact is. So you put in, um, you know, the job range, you put in what type of industry it is. Um, and so I believe it takes all of that into account when it creates the model. Does Ms. Thomas want to speak to that? Am I unmuted? I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so the answer to both those questions is yes, Commissioner Luke, Vice Mayor. Um, the, if you can see, if you can see exhibit A, of the, golly, this is from the memo to, to uh, you guys, to city manager, and it's gonna be page three of that document. If you can see that, um, you will see this is an exhibit that we had um, Sarasota County run for us. It's just a demo for Northport, but it was, a, it was actually um, a project that came to, to us from EFI in my first month of being in Northport. And so at the time we had no way, we had no place for these people to go, but it really is a solar operation. This was based on information that I had at the time from a company that actually had an interest in Northport. So we wanted to just for fun, see what that would have looked like over time. So if you can see um, this talks very specifically about how much, how many jobs there would have been in the top right corner, you can see there would have been nine direct jobs with an average wage of 57,231. We would have had a direct spinoff, a direct, uh, a direct uh, salary of 60,000, but with spinoff jobs, that brings that number down just a little bit. So those are the spinoff jobs you're talking about. I think we talked about spinoff, uh, that's part of it. Part of it's also secondary and tertiary jobs or industries that come about as a result of this solar company having resided here, okay? So what we did was we put in what the impact would be at the time that this um, hypothetical sort of a solar company came to town, in which case we're looking at the $151,068 in incentive. And we would have, we're looking at this over a potential of 10 years, but you can see that the payback happens at year five based on this particular model that we're using. Can you see that? I don't know if that's perfectly clear where you're- Yes, I, I saw that, but on one of the charts and it's net benefits over the next 10 years, it says Sarasota County Pub, and I'm not sure what that public, means. Public, yes. Public. Okay. That yeah. looks like it's a negative. Um, you may be looking at public schools. Oh, public schools. Okay, yeah. that makes it's sense. Not taking into account any of the impact fees for the public yeah. schools. So if that's that was mentioned in the in the legislative. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So public support, it does take a look at all the various ways that you can um, benefit. And we did not plug in anything relative to the like local schools impact or any of that sort of thing. So this resides very specifically in the city and the net benefit and the cost over time, when the payback would happen and the direct net result of this kind of project. We additionally added two more projects that are at the very end of this document. Um, they're labeled exhibits C and D. They are actual projects which happened in Sarasota County this year. Uh, in fact, I worked on both these projects before I left the EDC. One called Project Almond, it's on page 15. 
and the other one um, is Project Rolling Stone. You can imagine that Dustin Wells definitely named these. So um, these also will show you something that the county actually voted on, given this information with a similar kind of modeling that we're presenting to you. And this shows how that would work in, in terms of incentive per job rate, the rate of return, and how quickly it gets paid back. So these are models uh, just for your, your edification so that you can see that when we put these um, targeted industries with the job count, whether they're local to us as um, employees, how many of these people have to be hired locally or can get transported in, all of those things can be accounted for in this kind of model. And it takes into account the kinds of things you guys were asking for, which are also in um, documents that you provided. You were provided in, in separate documents other than this first one. So I, I hope that answers your question about where this yes, is. It, yes, it does. You actually took care of the other one with the, the school too, because I didn't know what hub was supposed to be spelled out. But yeah, that took care of that. Uh, I think it's a great report. It made sense to me that if you're going after targeted industries that have a higher wage, you're going to have a higher spinoff. What just happened? I have no idea. Hold up, guys. Nicole is trying to share her screen. Who? Uh, oh, thank you, Nicole. <laughs> But it, it makes it makes sense to me that uh, if you've got a higher wage, you've got a higher spinoff because they're out spending the money in the economy. So I figured it would be connected to it also. So thank you. You did take care of all my questions. Thank you, Mayor. You're quite welcome. I don't know. I, I can't seem to get it to work. So <laughs> I will. <laughs> I was trying to pull try, That's why I didn't try, Nicole. Uh, and by the way, this is Mel Thomas for the record. I failed to say that. So. It, it's not like Teams, is it, Nicole? No, not nearly as easy as Teams. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't see anybody else's hand up. Um, I, I'll go ahead and, and ask a couple of questions because um, I'm, I'm looking at the PowerPoint presentation, and I, I'm i trying to understand like category one. Um, it says here 10 or more full-time employees, and it says that there's no retail sales. So if, if a company comes here and they have retail sales, they would not be eligible for the deferral if they have 10 or more employees. I that's think correct. That's limiting. I think that's limiting. I think we're saying if it's specific, if it's primarily retail sales. Am I right, Nicole? Um, so the way that it's drafted right now, I believe it, it's no retail sales um, until they get to at least 50 full-time jobs. Right. Okay. So we have a Northport has a lot of mom and pop garage startup small businesses here in Northport. Um, they have, you know, between 10 and 20 employees or 10 and 24 employees. And, and they wouldn't be eligible because they have retail sales. I, I don't understand the, the thought process because they are manufacturing companies. They are these light industrial kind of companies. And they have a smaller amount of personnel, but they do do retail sales. So based on this, they wouldn't be eligible for any kind of deferral. And I don't understand why we would not have them even be considered. So that, that's correct. And I apologize. We have an updated version of this PowerPoint that um, we, I guess, didn't, didn't get uploaded. Um, but in that, we actually specified dr and drill down to the um, targeted industries, which is what you had asked us to bring back today. Um, and the definitions are included in your backup. But so for example, category one is aviation and aerospace, life sciences, manufacturing and defense and homeland security. So the idea was to, to really offer this deferral program to the targeted industries 
And then when you get to the more broad categories, they have to be creating a greater impact with at least 50 jobs. And um, again, I'll let Mel speak to that more if, if I didn't explain it correctly, but um, that was the general idea as, as I understood the direction last time. I'm shaking my head as so though you can see me. This is Mel Thomas, and I couldn't agree with you more. That's a great explanation. Okay, so so the the scenario based on the PowerPoint that I have in front of me shows that the business type is manufacturing, processing, fabricating, or producing sale items, but they would not be considered because they have retail sales. Is, is that correct? Or is this whole PowerPoint like throw it away and start over? No, it's just the business type in the middle that has been refined. Um, and that's based on the definitions and the targeted industries that, that we researched and what economic development is trying to bring to the city. But the retail sales component has not changed. Right, I, I, do, I want you to realize that, and this is Mel Thomas, sorry, um, we're not talking that they can do, that, it, that if not, you can't do any retail sales. It's saying that your primary business is driven by manufacturing or process work. So for instance, if, let's just use King Plastic as an example, okay? So King Plastic manufactures, but it doesn't mean they can have a retail sale uh, or retail operation on the side of their operation. They wanted to sell signage or something of that nature their primary industry is manufacturing. And that's what we're looking at in a category one kind of environment here with only 10 or, 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 or more, 10 or more full-time jobs. So it doesn't say you can't do retail. It just says it's not your primary industry. So if their primary industry is to manufacture a widget and they have 12 employees, and that widget is something that they sell locally and nationally and even internationally, they would not be eligible for deferrals based on this, correct? Incorrect, or it shouldn't be that way. So no, the, the, uh, the intent is export. So you're manufacturing to get it out of market, out of local market. Your intent is not to sell it as a primary gauge inside your marketplace. Does that make sense? I mean, what you're doing, if you're manufacturing anything, you're obviously selling it. <laughs> but, but you're a manufacturer of something that goes outside your market. It's not a retail storefront. We're trying to distinguish between retail sales like a dress shop or a drugstore or a grocery store and a business that actually manufactures where their FFE, their, their furniture, fixtures, and equipment is heavy or big or that kind of thing. Do you understand where I'm coming from on that? I do. I just disagree that if they're, they, they sell here locally out of their storefront and sell nationally or internationally, why would we um, say no to them? I, I just, that's just my thought process. Yes, ma'am, I understand your question. And one more thing just to try to clarify. You're talking about impact. So you're, what you're trying to do is allow a company to stretch a large impact fee. So we're not talking about $15,000 or $25,000. We're usually talking about huge sums of money, much larger sums of money. And that's what you're trying to get back in the way of manufacturing or category one or category two kind of business. So I think the reason, if I'm not mistaken, this originally came from Cape Coral. And I think we mm -hmm. would do that retail sales there. It really should probably be category two should show retail sales, but not category one. And that's only because of the market, the market export piece of it. You want to sell primarily outside your market in order for it to be considered um, serious revenue producing for your city. If your payback for the impact is not going to come in two to 10 years, then that, that puts that company at a serious disadvantage of being able to pay back the impact fee. So retail sales alone typically don't do that for you, especially small small shop 
small shop kinds of things. Okay. Um, and, and just for the record, I, I, I will, I am against a 10 year payback. That is just too long for impact fees. I think we have the hotel, I believe is at three years or possibly five. I'd have to go back and look at the contract, but 10 years, the markets become too volatile and, and there's a greater risk of losing um, that money that we could have collected up front. Um, so I need to understand too about this, employees are residents. How do you, verify how do you determine that they're a resident um payroll. How do you prove it? they have to provide payroll records we we did this um back during the recession we did some economic development incentives mayor that required them to hire a certain number of employees they had to be at certain average salaries and they had to be net new employees so every quarter they had to provide payroll tax returns to include addresses of their employees and proof of those addresses, which would be like a um, driver's license, or there's various ways we can we can prove it. No problem with that, because they can move. <laughs> well, and we'll know that at the end of the quarter when they send us a new one that has more information. But every quarter. Um, it, it is a check and balance. It's not perfect. And you're right, people can move. They can move throughout the quarter. Um, but the idea is that if they do provide that information, you know, one, people don't typically move that often. And it is hopefully will attract businesses to come to Northport and employ Northport people. Um, wait, I've got my hand up again. Here we go. Sorry, I, I, don't, I don't see that. Go ahead. Well, this is Mel Thomas for the record. And um, you all in your workshop actually asked for this. You, you looked at it in the paper model and you all liked it. I went back and listened to this along with Carl. Several of us listened to this more times than I can count. And uh, it was something you asked us to bring back in the model. So this was included for that purpose. I understand. I just wanted to hone in a little bit more that we're, we're starting to make some policy decisions here and I wanted to get a full understanding of how you quantify who lives here and who doesn't and I was unaware that you would be asking for quarterly reports and payroll records and all that kind of stuff. Um, continuing on with your PowerPoint presentation, I think it's your second to last page. It says here supplemental impact fee deferral point scale. It's the little chart on the page. What is that? So this is this is based off the Cape Coral ordinance. It's kind of like a bonus um, on top of whatever. Um, so on the slide previously, it determines the category they are with, um, you know, the extra they can get if the employees are residents or if they have so many employees are residents, they can end up with a certain year term. Um, they can get bonus points to uh, equate to an additional amount of deferral time. So they could add an additional six months of deferral or up to a year of deferral, depending on how the points in this um, chart add up. Okay, so these are bonus points. Gotcha. So what happens, I, are, are, we, are we still going to have the commission be approving every single um application because there's one chart that says city council approval for 200 or more employees are we still going to be doing it where the employees are approved i'm sorry the commission is improving each application i think that might be a policy decision for you all i think if we have something where it falls into one of these categories and we have really defined um mechanisms for determining what deferral they qualify for, um, then we could certainly do it administratively. But if the, the commission wants to see everyone, then we can build that into the ordinance as well. Okay. Can you please- Currently, you know, the code would require anything to come before commission and there'd be agreements that have to come before commission. 
whatever, if the, the board takes action today, whatever the board decides, we'll have to look at the code and figure out the appropriate legal ways to document um, the policy, whether it's a code amendment or an adoption of a policy, whatever that might be. But currently the, the code requires that. Thank you for that clarification, city attorney. Could, could you explain this stacking thing? I've read the, the your response about stacking and your suggestions and stuff. Could you just explain it again? Because it, I understand if they qualify for a deferral and they get approved for a deferral and then they expand their business in three years and they want to get uh, another deferral on impact fees I, I know I wasn't a fan of stacking to begin with. So could you please explain what you guys came up with regarding the stacking? Yes. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm looking back at this again. So essentially it helps um, for buyouts and expansions of companies. It allows for um, the growth to be incentivized as well as an existing business. So by allowing them, if they're, if they're into a deferral period, they can get a new deferral period, but it stands on its own. It doesn't start at the end of the first deferral period. It would start at the time of expansion or growth. So they would have two possible agreements simultaneously? Correct. So how, how do we address the bankruptcy of a business? Especially, you know, COVID-19 has sure changed a lot of the way that I'm thinking on a lot of these things. Um, if you have a, a business that goes bankrupt and they have an agreement, how, how do we get our impact fees back? Um, what if they sell the property or they sell the business? How do we get those impact fees back? So currently under the code, if any deferral is granted, then um, we essentially execute a notice of non-payment and get a type of lien on the property. Um, however, like we discussed, it's been a while now, a while back, mm -hmm. we would not have any kind of priority lien. And it just, it depends, first of all, it depends on if these businesses are property owners. Secondly, it, exactly. it would depend on what other, if there were a property involved, what other liens were on the property? Um, if they were superior liens, like a mortgage lien, if they, um, you know, what the timetable is for when they were filed. Liens also follow after the superiority, they follow a first in time, first in right rule typically. So that is some some security, but it's it's no guarantee. Um, just, just like some of our other types of liens that the city files, Sometimes, sometimes we get money for them, most of the times we don't. Um, as far as bankruptcy goes, there are different types of bankruptcy. There's one type of bankruptcy where they reorganize the debts and it always helps if you're, um, again, if your debt is secured by property. And another type of bankruptcy, they discharge debts. So there, there aren't gonna be any kind of guarantees. Here we would have not only the lien, the lien, uh, possibly securing it, but also a breach of contract action. But again, if you get a judgment in a civil case for breach of contract or any other type of action, sometimes the judgment's only as good as the paper it's written on. You have to have something, there has to be money there to collect it and the, the type of funds that you can go after. You also can't go after all types of funds. So it really depends, it's very fact specific and if the business is set up the right way, the kinds of businesses that would probably qualify here, you know, should be, then you can only go after the business. You can't go after the owners individually. So you're capped at whatever the business's assets are. Thank you. Um, I'll yield the floor. I see Commissioner Hanks has some questions. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Hanks. No, um, I think uh, Ms. Thomas, kind of answer, but I, but I just want to clarify, Ms. Thomas, uh, uh, when you said in here, no retail sales, it's because you're trying to direct target manufacturing. It's not saying that if a nature zone comes in, monstrous bakery that, uh, that uh, sells to virtually every 
grocery chain in America wants to have a little uh, side discount store, like kind of like, like we have here in Port Charlotte, that they couldn't do that because about one half of 1% of their sales or one tenth of 1% of their sales would be out of that store. You're not saying that they can't do that. It's just, you're trying to specific <clears throat> target specific industries that we're trying to drive into our area, correct? That's absolutely correct. This is Mel Thomas responding and you said it so much better than I, so. Great, and, and I think it is important um, that, we, that we try not to pigeonhole ourselves and we put every option on the table, especially as the mayor mentioned, we're, we are coming out of an unprecedented age right now and people need to be able to get back to work and, and that's exactly what we need to be, this needs to be our single most priority. I, I mean, we're looking at an unemployment rate that is, that is worse than, than, than the Great Depression and so coming back out of this, we need to leave every option on the table. And this is designed so that, so that you can specifically target these, the specific industries that you're looking for. So you don't have 5 billion just 7-Elevens and just mattress stores and just auto zones, but you're actually targeting and you're incentivizing and you're making an area that maybe somebody wasn't looking at earlier, a little bit more sexy, you know, for those investors to come in and uh, be able to, to, uh, to invest within, within the area of these higher paying jobs. So I think it is very important um, uh, that we look at uh, uh, every opportunity here. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't take any of it off the table. I think 10 years is something to be on the table. You don't have to approve 10 years. You can approve three, you can approve two. I wouldn't even take off the fact that you couldn't um, um, uh, get uh, offer a, a complete um, forgiveness of a def of a impact fee. It's not it's not that you'll ever use it. I just don't want to pigeonhole ourselves because you never know what's going to happen in any given age, as we just saw here. I mean, this was exactly what I was talking about. We need to be careful with our emergency fund because there's going to be things come up that we may have never thought of before. And I literally said that last year and look at what happened. This whole thing came out of the air and now we're in a forced recession that we were forced to get into. And so I just think we need to be very careful. And I think we, we don't want to pigeonhole ourselves in any area, but allow um, all opportunities to be on the table. And I think, and I thank you, Ms. Mel, for uh, definitely clarifying a, about the retail sale because I do not want to say that they can't sell anything. Mm -hmm. I do think it's important that their primary business is not selling mattresses to the to the guy driving down the road, but it's manufacturing the mattresses. And out of the mattresses that they sell nationwide or worldwide, maybe they sell one hundredth of one percent right here locally because it's their local community and they just want to give back at an extreme discount. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Emmerich, I see your hand is up. <clears throat> You'll have to unmute, Commissioner Emmerich. I can't hear you. And nobody I can hear you. I them buttons up there. I've been messing it up all day. I didn't even know my camera or whatnot. But, um, now, my question is, when we discussed this before, didn't we say that we had the option to grant up to a certain amount of years? Because Commissioner Hanks was just talking about that. If it came before us and they had a possibility of up to 10 years, but we only allowed them to have three, don't we have that option? Or is this etched in stone that they can have up to 10 years? Did you hear that? I heard it. I'm waiting to see about who's going to give the response. I believe we have an well, option. I did. I don't want to jump out there, and I think uh, this is Mel responding, and I'll take first shot at it. That's a policy decision. You, you know, mm -hmm. you guys can make that decision any way you want to. Um, I, I would suggest to you that um, that you not cut off your nose to spite your face, and you leave yourselves open to being able to say yes or no, thumbs up, thumbs down on any given project that might come your way. Um, if it doesn't sound appetizing, that's what these wonderful models are for, is to help you make those decisions. You don't see a return on investment in a certain number of years or months or however you craft the model. Um, then you have the opportunity to say, no, this is not for us. We're not going to give them that deferment. So I encourage you to leave it open-ended in that way so that you do allow yourself 
um, and you don't have to keep revisiting the policy over and over and over again. Yeah, because I, in my opinion, I would want to have that flexible because if it's if it's mandatory at that ten years, let's just say that, and they're doing the stacking like Mayor McDonald was talking about, they could be possibly owing us money for up to fifteen years. Yes, the two in the middle will be coincide, but you have your beginning and your end. And we're not collecting impact fees for 15 years to get our total reimbursement. Anything could happen within 15 years. It's very unlikely for a business to go under without something going wrong in under five, six years. They'll still yeah. be here. It's not true. I said it's more possible. You know, it's anything's possible, but it's not more than likely that they're going to shut their doors within six years. They may have hard times in eight years, but they're still on the hook for 15 and we lose out or we get at the end of the line, depending on where we're at for reimbursement through the courts. So, I mean, having it open and having us have it presented to us to come up with a time span, I'm in agreement with. I just don't want it to be an automatic 10 years. That's so all I was getting at. That's definitely policy direction that we would need to get from, from the board today. The current ordinance limits it to three years. So if we're gonna go past that. We do have to um, amend the ordinance, which we'll likely be doing with all of this anyways. Um, the other thing is that we are looking at procurement of the model that we used for, uh, that the EDC uses so that we can use that locally. Um, and we could actually bring that to you with every deferral um, proposal um, to evaluate what it's going to look like. And something I would like to point out, Mayor, just to make sure it's clear for discussion under the existing code language or even under potential proposed uh, code language that may come as a result of this discussion, there's no requirement that all of the impact fees be deferred until the end of that period. There can also be a payment, um, kind of payment plan over the time, X amount due in year one, Y amount due in year two, et cetera. Thank you, City Attorney. Um, uh, Commissioner Emmerich, did you have anything else? No, I'm, I'm good with that. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor, round two. Uh, I'm, I'm in the same category as Commissioner Hanks. Uh, I believe this is economic development as it, at its best. I think the modeling that has been done has pulled in these targeted industries that we want so that the city can excel instead of just continuing to have retail. Retail comes with housetops. Uh, we are looking at other industries that come because they're enticed to come or they want to come. It's just not out of the need and necessity of having X amount of housetops. But in the um, slideshow, it appears to me that this is recommending no more than a six year deferral, uh, depending upon the amount of employees that they have. Uh, Ms. Thomas, am I seeing that correctly that you guys have in this chart a recommendation because of amount? And if it's 200 or more, it would have to come to the city commission for any type of approval. Commissioner, uh, Vice Mayor, this is uh, Mel Thomas responding. Um, I actually think this night, this might need to be bounced back to Nicole because she and her staff work more on the Cape Coral model. And I think a lot of this was pulled very closely from the Cape Coral model, if I am not mistaken. So, um, Nicole, would you, you want to add to that? Absolutely. The six year is um, the, the maximum that we recommend based on the table. Um, and it is the average that um, my staff saw during their research on this topic. All right, but, and if they have 200 or more full-time employees, it says city council approved. What do you mean by that? Meaning that the impact of something with 200 or more full-time employees is going to be greater. And so it would allow for more flexibility for the commission to um, determine if they want to allow for more gracious deferral periods. Greater years than the six. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, it is not meaning that each and every deferral has to come back to the commission, correct? Or are you wanting each of the deferrals to come back? As I mentioned earlier, I think that's a policy decision that uh, we would like to get from the board today. Thank you. So since I don't see any other lights on, um, we are, I understand that we have to bring businesses to Northport and that's what this whole purpose is. Um, to give them the incentives to defer the impact fees um, over time, whether that be three years, six years, whatever, um, whatever the commission decides is the, the maximum. But we just saw in two months, over 27 million people lose their jobs. We have seen over the past two months, numerous businesses have to close their doors and we don't even know how many of those are going to reopen. So while I understand that we need to look into the future as far as economic development, right now, we also have a responsibility to make sure we're getting these impact fees back. And we have to be concerned about the length of time so that way then we can get the money back quicker as opposed to over a longer period of time. I mean, three years is, it seems like a very long time and it should be able to be paid back at that point. Um, to go out to six years, that's a whole different economic time frame. A lot happens year to year, month to month. And now we even can say a lot happens day to day. And we have to be very careful with giving these referrals to ensure that we are going to get it back as, as quickly as we can. And that is what is my biggest concern, because if they don't pay their impact fees, the citizens ultimately are picking up that tab based on that impact. And that concerns me greatly. I am one that would like to be able to approve each and every one of these deferral packets. What is, the, are we having a minimum? I know our current code says that it has to be a minimum of a, I think it's a million dollar value of a business. Are we going to continue with that kind of um, mindset? I know that we said to use the Cape Coral as the starting point, but that doesn't mean we have to do it word for word and item by item. We can change it to fit our needs. Absolutely, and I think we've I think we've done that. And if we want to add different criteria to to this, um, you know, in terms of like you said, the million dollar um, or million dollar valuation um, that we discussed before, which currently the ordinance, um, you know, we can certainly do that. But we've changed um, the Cape Coral model into a Northport specific one by looking at what industries the city is targeting and how right. we want it to benefit us locally. Um, I'm raising my hand or I'm trying to. <laughs> Smell Thomas trying to raise her hand. Um, may I ask? Okay, thank you. Um, another thing we've not really spent a lot of time doing is looking at, and, and city attorney, don't, don't hit my fingers yet because I don't know the right word and I know you can give it to me. We talked about mitigation, and when I talk about mitigation, it's something like giving a daycare center up for the city as in lieu of um, impact fees. There's that's not the word we use. It's not in our um, in our ordinance. But think think in those terms. And 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 um, city city attorney came up with the right language when we were in workshop, and I just can't come up with it right now. So one of the things we might consider and can still take back and work on would be what are those projects? What are those things that are immediate in return and don't actually come back in the form of cash to the city or in some other way, whether it's improvement to the sidewalks or public utilities of some sort, or perhaps it's in the gift of a park or in the gift of um, a daycare center is the, always the best example. Uh, so those are things too that are not built into this, but we wanted to see about flavor. And if you were enjoying kind of the look-see that we thought you gave us direction for, and this was just our first deep dive and the best way we could model for you and explain how the 
process of modeling would work and help inform your decision making. We can we can craft this almost any way you want to, uh, but taking into those in, into account those things that we have approached. I know, for instance, Vice Mayor talked about last mile. Well, that's embedded in logistics here. So what we tried to do is to open this up in the largest way possible so that you could see if over two years or over three years or however many years you would cap it, plus other factors that might weigh in can have an impact and not discourage a business from opening up here but rather going down the street to somebody that's uh, got a little wider arms open. So that was the intent. And, um, you know, if we've not gotten there, then, you know, we're welcome, we, we, we'll, we'll certainly go back and, and, and get it right. Um, I just wanted to, wanted to kind of impress upon you that there's, there's this, this model that's Cape Carl, you guys were sort of fascinated with that before, and I think that's why we went that route. So I see, thank you, uh, Ms. Thomas. Commissioner Carison, I see your hand is up. Yes, I just, uh, maybe, uh, well, I don't know. I don't think Ms. Thomas was there at the time, but we had another previous economic development incentive program where um, it was either the entrepreneurship or there was something in place where we had a company come to us for an extension and they had to do like two extensions during the I call it the depression but it was during the you know that horrible um time where just no money was going in and I don't see us ever getting to that place because of this particular pandemic but uh, my point is, is that they gave a, a few extensions and then finally they came back and paid it plus interest. So I guess I don't, I, I'm trying to remember what the name of that or what that program specifically was. I can't remember, but um, I mean, I don't have the same concerns because I do believe for the majority of them that there's, there's ways that uh, you know, you can, you can get the money back, uh, be it legal matter or not, but I do know something had existed and maybe city manager can remember. Uh, but, uh, I know that we were there when they came back and said, Hey, by the way, we're expanding our business and we paid back everything that you guys lent us. Maybe someone can answer that. Yes, yeah, uh, Commissioner, um, we had a couple of programs back during the, mm -hmm. um, the recession that was in place. Um, I believe it was about $100,000 that the commission set aside for economic development incentives. One um, is where I get the comment I made earlier about getting payroll records. It was for a, a local business that they had to create a certain number of net new jobs. So, and they had to have a certain um, salary, average salary also. So, that that particular business we had one um that was highly successful and yes they did get everything back we had one that was unsuccessful and that one it was and the argument i would make about the problem with that which is very different than the one that we're doing right now was was the checks and balances in place when we did the first one there was next to nothing that was in place and we learned a lesson very quickly and for the second one that was successful we required payroll records. We required monthly reporting to us um, of net new jobs. They didn't, and that one also went out in phases because they didn't get the money until they proved that they had the net new jobs. So they had to earn the incentives. It was, like I say, that one, they, they were successful. They had a couple of extensions that were granted because towards the end, they were having a hard time getting some of the net new jobs, but eventually they did accomplish all of their goals. Um, I don't remember the name of the program, but I do remember that we had it. And like I say, um, being in finance at the time, they provided us and the economic development. And that was a couple of economic development managers ago. Um, but they provided both parties with all of the required documentation to prove that they had the net new jobs with the required salaries. And I believe the salary was somewhere in the 40 something thousand dollar a year average range that they had to pay.
Did you have anything else, Commissioner Carson? No, I just, I, no, I was just saying that, you know, it's been done in the past and it, there were extensions made and I'm, I'm confident that this program will work with its checks and balances. And uh, I think that the, all departments have done a wonderful job with this and um, I'm excited to see it take place. Thank you, Commissioner Carson. Um, City Manager, the, I, I don't know, it's called Exhibit A and it's a demo for Northport and I know um, Ms. Thomas and Vice Mayor was looking at it at great length. I see Sarasota County's name all over this. Is Sarasota County gonna run these reports for us each time we get a deferral application? Well, that was, was mentioned um, earlier that we're actually working to see what we can do to procure this software that they use ourselves so that we wouldn't need them to do this. Oh, my favorite subject, software. <laughs> and how much is that gonna cost? The, the cost is uh, 5,500 a year. Um, and we'd be looking at the cost between planning, we're looking at sharing costs between planning and economic development because we would also most likely use it to um, do the fiscal analysis when we have to do them for planning petitions as well. It's definitely a much cleaner output than what we're currently using. So is this going to be uh, implemented like track it is being implemented or is it going to be implemented like, I don't know, give me a, give me a name of a IT. We are more on the hopes program. that it will be implemented like Zoom has for these meetings and highly successful and very fast than track it, which was the opposite of that. Yeah, it's web. Yeah. Yeah, this is much more of a plug and play software than the others are. Well, that's what we were told about track it. <laughs> All right, so you're saying it's $5,500 $5, a year. And it serves, um, yeah. serves a couple purposes too. It's not just for this economic development one. It's also, as uh, Nicole mentioned, we currently have our fiscal analysis modeling software that is um, Excel-based and let's just say slightly outdated. This would replace that as well and provide you a much cleaner output for those, those uses. Gotcha. So, all right, I guess we're close to getting a motion and giving staff some direction. So let's do, I, I don't know, Miss Nicole, we, we kind of threw around all sorts of different um, ideas and, and mindsets, some, some matching and some not so much. Um, what exactly are you looking for from us? Um, so I guess direction on, um, you know, some of the things that we talked about today. So for example, um, you know, if you want there to be a higher level of retail sales allowed, um, what the maximum number of years you want to have, um, do you want this to be managed at an administrative level by staff unless certain situations apply, or do you want every petition to come to you? Um, so I think there's, okay. those are the All basic, right. that would be that's kind of what I was thinking. So maybe what we could do is um, maybe get a motion for each one um, and, and vote on each one uh, instead of putting it all together in, in, in a package that we probably can't put a neat little bow on because I think there's each of us have a different um, perspective on each individual topic. And if you lump them all together, it may not pass. So... Um, uh, Vice Mayor, I see your light is on. Oh, Wait. yeah. I heard, I heard Vanessa. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I saw your light on first, Vice Mayor. I like what they have presented. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we this is a jump start to economic development. It's definitely a tool for uh, neighborhood development and the economic development department. I think going into this, uh, bring them all back. I mean, bring them to the commission, let the commission look at them. They've already got on these charts, how many years, how much uh, staff and stuff like that. They have category one, two, and three. 
So I think the work that staff has done is superb. And to give them uh, the right to move ahead and bring an ordinance or whatever needs to come back, I think would uh, put it in the pipeline. But personally, I would like to see, because this is a new startup, that they bring each of these requests to the commission and the commission give the approval for their recommendation. So in my opinion, I can give you a motion right now, and loop it all into one. Okay, well, before you do that, let's hear from the others that have their hands raised. Um, uh, Commissioner Carson. First, I just wanted to know what were the three things you needed direction on? Type of retail, petition by staff or not, and then wasn't there another thing? I so heard if, the time. Um, I, what? If there's a maximum number of years. Mm -hmm. Oh, minimum number of years. That's what I meant. Maximum. maximum. Maximum number of years. Okay. All right. So let me start with petition by staff. I think it should be to the staff because they have the categories. If there's anything that's a question outside the categories, if there's something that we're not sure of, if it if it goes within that quarter, ca category, maybe there's an appeal system that then goes to the commission. Um, the the only the extensions other than an appeal system should go to the commission. Um, and then the number of years should be five because any business it takes three years to really uh, you know, secure itself. And type of retail, I should be, I mean, I'm not sure about the type of real retail, honestly. Let's face it, people would die for a Target to get here or, a, you know, Chick-fil-A to open up. So I don't know what you're calling retail, right? I mean, I think that maybe it's about, I understand it's providing, what, 50 jobs or more? Is that what it was, Nicole? Um, so currently the, the proposal, um, does not allow for retail sales, except like what Mel was explaining is like the incidental, the, the minor, um, component, um, until you get to, I believe two or get to a hundred jobs, no, 50, 50 jobs. Yeah. It's um, so okay. the, the question about the, the targeted industry is pretty well narrowed down. So. The question was just because there was so much discussion of retail sales, is there anything you want us to change as, as it relates to that? Okay. All right. Well, if you have your, if you have the targeted industries down, that's, um, you know, and I would hope that those targeted industries are actually put within jurisdictions per se of the city's uh, area. You know, you want this type of targeted industry in this area and so on and so forth. And and maybe that's something we need to look at in the future, but for now, I'm okay with the 50 jobs. I think that's it, right? Can I add something to Commissioner Carazone's comments about the five years? Yes, go ahead. Uh, in the chart, they only go five years. The sixth mm -hmm. year is if they have 90 to 100% Northport residents. That's the only time that they go into the sixth year, just to make sure everybody knew that. Otherwise, they capped it at the five years, too. Thank you. Did you have anything else, Commissioner Carasone, before we move on? I just want to be clear so the five years exists and they can't go beyond the five years unless they have the majority of Northport residents then I'm fine as it's stated thank you thank you Thanks Commissioner thank you Commissioner Carison Commissioner Hanks you your turn yes ma'am thank you um I'm I am fine with what staff has presented here. I mean, I think it's a fun, you know, it, you know I think it looks good. Um, the only thing that I want to recommend is I again, I don't want to take anything off the table. I have said from the very beginning of sitting on this board that I am not one to give to 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 award waivers. 
However, I do not think that should never be, uh, that that should be something that's completely off the table. And the reason I say that is because every day, every economy, every year is completely different. And I think uh, some of these things need to be mm-hmm. looked at individually according to all those boundaries. Um, that being said, um, I agree with Commissioner Carson that um, if it, if, if, if what the petition is within the, the, uh, the categorical definitions um, as defined, I think it, that, uh, uh, that staff level approval is fine. However, I wanna make sure that there is the opportunity for you know, that, if, uh, that if somebody has a reason to be beyond five years, they have an opportunity, as Commissioner Carasone said, to petition beyond that. And then staff would present that to the commission. I think anything outside of that would definitely be need commission approval. Uh, whether it's a waiver would definitely need commission approval. Any extensions beyond time would need commission approval. If it's outside of, of, of what that category, you know, what, what those categories are that we approve, it has to come. But what I don't want to do is I don't want staff to, to, to also say, listen, you don't fit in our category. So we have to say no. I want to make sure that these businesses, they have the opportunity to petition a no, and then let the board, uh, you know, who represent the people make that decision, stand before the people and, and, and answer for whatever the decision is, is made at that point. But I just don't want to take anything off the table because we do not know what tomorrow or the year after or a decade from now brings and um, you know, let each commission be responsible to the people for that. But, um, but I think if we hogtie ourselves, we may find ourselves in a position that we need to do something, but now we've got to do an ordinance change and now we're six months down the road before we can even take a look at something. I mean, look at we, I mean, currently we're having to do ordinance changes for a, for a, a brewery, right? And it's taken months and months and months and months to do. So I think if we, if, if we don't hogtie ourselves, um, then I think everybody's going to be better off. We don't have to use them, but if we don't honk to ourselves, I think everybody's going to be better off doing it that way. Um, so uh, that's what I would say. I agree with, with what staff said. I just want to make sure we leave an opportunity outside of that, that they can petition the commission for in whatever category they need. And I do not, and, and I personally think we should leave waivers in the ordinance just, just so we can look at the future. And if the future determines that, then it's there, but we'll let them answer for whatever decisions that they make in the future. Thank you, Commissioner Hanks. Uh, Commissioner Emmerich? Commissioner Emmerich? I'm coming, <laughs> trying to reach my buttons. Yeah, um, I wanna go off of what uh, Commissioner Hanks said because he hit at one of the points I was looking at. What if it was a staff denial? And and what were their repercussions if staff denied it, if we left that up to staff and not having it come to the commission? So if we were leaving it up to staff, there still has to be an avenue for a business to be able to bring it to the commission if they, for any reason, are denied, if we leave it up to staff to go ahead and do these approvals. And as long as they meet the guidelines, is it automatic or is it on a judgment type thing? That's that's some of the things that we need to know what staff's looking at. You know, as long as they meet the criteria, is that an automatic deferral? That's when it sort of has to come back to the commission to see what's right and what's wrong. So I'm a little I'm a little tossed on those lines unless it's you know written in stone to where the business has the option, but so does the city. And, and that's where I'm at. So I just wanted to throw that out there. That's where I'm thinking right now. Thank you very much, um, Vice Mayor. And then I'm gonna get consensuses on these various uh, topics that we talked about. And that way then staff will have something to work with and come back with an ordinance. All right, Commissioner uh, Vice Mayor. I, I appreciate, uh, first of all, Commissioner Carazone and then Commissioner Hanks, and then also the same things that Commissioner Emmerich just said. That is the belief that I had in the very beginning when I started to talk about it, but I thought there was a leaning of going, having to look at each of the applications. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I would rather leave it in the hands of staff and then come to commission for an appeal. So just to get it out, you know, on the record that I am in agreement with what was stated on those. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Hanks, and then I'll wrap up with my final thoughts and then we'll get consensuses. Go ahead, Commissioner Hanks. Yeah, no, I just wanted to to uh, to uh, speak kind of to what Commissioner Emmerich was saying because I appreciate what he's saying, but I think for staff to make those decisions themselves, mm -hmm. it's based off of the decisions that the commission has already made that says you can't you 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 can operate between these these two goalposts. Anything beyond that, you you can't operate. They have an opportunity to 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 appeal beyond that. But if it fits within these two goalposts, then the commission is saying you're okay. And uh, so for me, I'm okay with staff making those decisions without the commission because we're making that decision right now. Um, I, you know, for you know for those time frames. So I'm perfectly fine with it, specifically because of that. I just wanted to make sure that nothing is off the table. There is opportunity for waivers, you know, even which, which I guess really, you don't, I mean, those would fall outside of the criteria. So it would come, they would petition for something like that anyways, and that would come to the commission. Um, so, so yeah, I just wanted to speak to what, to what Commissioner Emmerich said, hopefully to, uh, to, to encourage him that I think, uh, you know, this, you know, whatever's within those goalposts are, are what, you know, this commission decides. So they don't have to bring everything to us unless it's outside of those things. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So I, I appreciate everybody's hard work on this um, whole conversation. And I, I firmly believe we need to have a deferral process, but I don't feel comfortable giving this giving staff the um, authority and giving them the responsibility to say no to a business or saying yes to a business without us having the final say. Um, that's what the current code is. We made that very clear when we instituted the, the initial code that all applications come before commission. And I understand this goal post thing that Commissioner Hanks was talking about, and I under, I get that. I think we could do that for like maybe the one-year deferral or possibly those that have a two-year deferral. But anything greater than that also increases the risk that is being assumed that we need to be in, in control of. We need to know how many deferrals are out there. Um, if we don't see these applications, how are we going to know that staff has issued 15 deferrals on these companies for these companies? Um, how are we going to know um, if there's a minimum uh, business value? Because that was also in our initial um, ordinance that we have an initial. So we're not approving deferrals for mattress stores. We're defer, We're approving them for these targeted industries. But even some of these targeted industries might fall under that category of, of being on every single corner. Um, I, I saw thinking of that is like banks, banks and credit unions. Okay, so are they going to be able to be deferral? If we have all these banks coming forward asking for deferrals, is their business value really a million dollars? I don't know. Um, I agree with the residency and checking them. Thank you for that explanation. Um, how many jobs are we going to are we going to be approving this based on the categories listed and and the number of full time employees? Um, I think there's. I think we need to do each one by um, a, a consensus or a vote. But I, I I think five years is even too long. Of, of giving them time to pay back these deferrals. I think four years is, is, is fine if they need five. You know, this is on a case by case basis. I don't want to just give a parameter that isn't necessarily what we are ultimately looking for. I think each one of these applications is to be done on their own merits based on our targeted industries and what we're trying to accomplish. <clears throat> So those are my, my thoughts on this. Uh, Commissioner Emmerich, I see that your hand is up. This is going to be the final round so we can move on. So Commissioner Emmerich. 
I got it. I just wanted to reply to Commissioner Hanks. What I, my main concern was what if staff said no? Everything's still on the table. I just wanted to make sure there was an avenue for that business if staff said no. If everything's in the goalposts, like you had stated, that's all fine and dandy, but staff at some point could have a reason to say no. I just wanted to make sure that the avenue was still open if staff said no, that they were going to be able to bring it to the commission. So I understand completely everything that you were saying, you know, and, and going through with, when we go into these uh, consensus, the five years I'm fine with, and I'm pretty much fine with the way that we're going and uh, Commissioner Luke had uh, mentioned. So I'm good. That's all I got. We're saying okay. the same thing then. <laughs> you got it. You got all it. Right, so let's. Let's get a consensus. I see no more hands up and staff, after we're all done with this, I'm going to ask you if we've covered all of the directions that you need, okay? So I wrote down maximum of number of years. I, I am leaning towards four. So let's get a consensus because that's the least amount that I have heard so far. Um, the maximum number of years for deferral is four years. Commissioner Luke. I want to follow what they have stated. They have up to the five years and the six year is only if they have 90 to 100 employees. That is an incentive to, lo to keep the uh, employees local. I love incentives and we are, we're in an unprecedented time right now. We don't have a clue as to how many people are going to have to look for another job. And so by having this incentive, I think is beautiful. And if adding one more year to somebody that's going to employ, they would have to employ 100 to 199 employees. And if they can come and do 90 to 100%, give them that extra year, I say. Okay. And before we go on, let me, let me redo that. Okay. Let me start over, please. Um, We've all seen the PowerPoint presentation in the backup materials, and I'm looking at the page called Calculation of Impact Fee Deferrals by Category, and they have Category 1, Category 2, Category 3, and they have a list of how many employees and how many years that they can get a maximum for deferral and how many employees are residents. Maybe if we can start with that chart do we agree with that chart as the springboard for creating this ordinance? I think is, is going to sum this up very clearly. Does everybody know what chart I'm talking about? Have you seen it? I agree with a uh, staff's, uh, uh, staff's re re recommendation in totality, the, the way okay. they so this, this impact fee calculation chart, and I wish there was a page on here. I can't, I, <laughs> there's what it looks like. <laughs> um, can I get a consensus to approve that chart in totality? I'm a yes. Commissioner Hanks. I'm a yes for exactly what staff brought as recommended. I think we're, I mean, I think we could be done with this in a second if you would ask that. Okay, question. Commissioner Carison. So I thought that they were talking about changing the chart. Didn't they propose to change the chart? Or was that some other portion? That was... That oh, was the, they changed the chart. Wait, Nicole, go ahead. Uh, it was a different... Um, it was a different page. Yeah, it was a different page in PowerPoint. Um, it, that was... Um, new business and existing business mm -hmm. chart. The business types on that is is specific to the targeted industries. We've refined that chart, and we can always come back and refine that chart. Well, specific. yeah, this is all this is all coming back. Okay, so yeah, I'm fine with the chart, but I don't okay. know what this has to do with the three, because I'm with Commissioner Hanks. Just leave it as is and then allow for an uh, appeal process period boom done same here okay guys so hold up let's get a consensus to a consensus <laughs> Commissioner Amherst, were you a yes 
Yes. Thank you, and I'm a yes. So we, we have the consensus on that chart. I wish there was a page number on here, but it says category one deferral uh, employees and 90 to 100% employees uh, are residents. So now we need to get a consensus because there seems to be a little bit of um, difference of opinion on approval by commission for everything or approval by commission on what items. I, I am approval for every application. This is part of our job. This way we can monitor how many we're approving. Um, I don't know what anybody's thoughts are on that, um, but let's let's get some kind of a consensus about an approval process by commission. I'm I'm for all of them, Commissioner, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, I am for what several of us have discussed, and that is leaving it with the staff, and then for the appeals or petition or the appeals process for that to come back to the commission. They have identified what cat what businesses fit in each of those categories, and that is what the targeted businesses are. So, uh, I think that's fine. Just have the appeals process. Commissioner Hanks. Yes, Mayor. I, I don't I don't think anybody here is is on different pages. I think we're all on the same page. Um, except for you. I, I think if you asked a specific question, we would be done with this. Um, I am, I am. Nobody for wanted to do anything. I got to get this moving along. So that's what well, I'm well, trying that, to well, do. And, and that's what I'm saying. We have given you a consensus on everything. You're just, you're, uh, you're just pinpointing everything out. Yes. Uh, I go with, with staff's recommendation on everything. There is, there is a, um, there is an appeal process for anything outside of the goalposts that we as a commission establish according to what we have consensus on to go with what staff has recommended. I'm in agreement with his statement. I'm ready for a motion. I'm in agreement with both their statements. All right, so we got somebody who wants to make a motion. Let's move on. Go ahead, Commissioner Carison, make a motion. I'll approve the uh, impact fee deferral waiver best practices and program uh, as presented by staff with the addition of a appeal process. Um, and I believe that's about it. Second. So I have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Carison, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, Commissioner Carison? Nope, think we beat that one to death. <laughs> Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Anybody? Uh, I see Commissioner Hanks' hand is up. No, ma'am, that was from before. Sorry. I apologize. And commit uh, Vice Mayor? Uh, but my vote is a yes. If I haven't gotten there yet, I'm asking if there's any comment to the motion, Commissioner Vice Mayor. Do we want to put an amendment on so that it also includes the ability for waivers? But that is through the appeals process or petition to the commission only. I would like to ask Ms. Galehouse because my assumption is that as long as that's a part of the appeal process. Yes, or should we put that in there? There's a separate provision in the code um, for waivers, which unless we got direction from you, we would not remove. Okay, then I'm fine with the way with it being in the or where it is now. She said if they get if we give them approval to leave it in there is what she just said. No. No, if, if you don't tell us to take it out, we're gonna leave it. Yes, that's what okay. she said. I misunderstood you. Thank you. Vice Mayor, did you have anything to the motion? No, ma'am. Commissioner Emmerich, uh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Emmerich, were you the seconder? Yeah, I think so. No, I don't have right. anything. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. So we didn't talk about having a minimum 
business uh, value. I know that that's something that's in our current um, ordinance. And I'm, I don't know if we need to do an amendment on that or is that a moot point? Um, I don't know if Mel wants to speak to this. I'm not sure what the interaction between the criteria we put forward um, with plan um, with evaluation would be. I don't know if they are, they seem to me to be two separate issues. I think you really want to focus on getting the targeted industries and getting the right type of um, jobs in and for employees and employing local people. Um, but I'll let Mel speak to that as well. Now we're responding, Mel Thomas. Um, I think they are two separate issues. My sense is that, that we're really trying to diversify our economy. And that means let's leave it open, allowing for the, the, the greater number of industries to, to bear on this ordinance that we're trying to prepare. Um, I don't know that valuation is going to be helpful in that process, at least on the front end. I don't see people knocking down the doors yet until we've got some infrastructure in place and we become a bit more competitive down the line. You know, right now, this is the hurdle. You know, this is the hurdle is, is infrastructure and deferment. Um, so I, I don't think it's going to get us anywhere. It certainly doesn't solve the problem in terms of deferment. Okay. Thank you. So um, seeing nobody else's light on, we'll go ahead and take the vote. Um, motion maker was uh, Commissioner Carison, your vote, please. Yes. And I think it was Commissioner Emmerich that seconded it. Yes. Commissioner Hanks. Yes. Uh, Vice Mayor. Yes. And I am a hesitant yes. And the only reason why I'm going to vote yes on this is because I know it's coming back for a first reading in an ordinance form. And then I will look at it more closely once we have our own ordinance. So thank you very much staff on all your work and working through this. All right, guys, it is 8.30. We still have some more things to discuss. Do we want to take a health break or do we want to persevere? I say persevere. Commissioner Carison, Commissioner Amrich. What do we got left? Pardon? We didn't we have, have much left, right? What do we got, what do we we got left? Have, we have the discussion and possible action regarding the COVID-19 budgetary effects and commission communications and city manager um, and administrative review. Yeah, so we just have one more. And I have a feeling it's going to be a long one. I say we get started, see what happens. Get started, because you only got a few minutes left on me, because I only got 26% battery. <laughs> uh, you don't. Okay. All right. So um, the next item that we'll be discussing is the uh, discussion and possible action regarding the budget effects of COVID-19. This is my budget item. I mean, this is my agenda item, and we, I, I don't know if y'all read the legislative text, but we're in some really tough times ahead. And our budget, I know the taxes and all that for property taxes have already been collected and has been, um, you know, we've budgeted for it, but we have CIP projects that some haven't been started. We have surtax funding that's going to be cut. We have gas taxes that are definitely being cut because nobody's going anywhere. The biggest thing is, is we don't know how long this is going to last. Um, we can sit here and listen to the news all day long and you get 15 different ways of Monday of how long this is going to last. Some say it's another couple of weeks. Some say it's a couple of months. Some say it's going to last until Christmas. So who knows? But we have to start planning and talking about our budget and seeing what things we can possibly do now with our fiscal year 1920 budget and our CIP projects to help soften us and plan for our fiscal year 2021 budget. 
we we don't even know what's going to happen with property values or how this is going to affect the housing market how this is going to affect the construction we know it's affecting businesses um unemployment is through the roof so i kind of wanted to get a, a conversation started to give the city manager some clear direction on things that he can do now and bring back additional information on um, some of the things that I was, he, he gave us this memo and a couple questions arose just from the memo. Um, so this is, this is the thought process of why I created this. Um, some of the things I wanted to talk about is our employees, you know, uh, how many are furloughed? How many, are we laying anybody off? Do we need to lay anybody off? Hiring, new hiring, um, FEMA, you know, in the memo, he mentions that some of these expenses that we're incurring that we're paying for right now are eligible for FEMA, but how much is that already? We know FEMA doesn't pay within 30 days. They take years. This is money that we have to pay out. Um, have we purchased all the vehicles? Maybe we can hold off on purchasing some of these vehicles. We have to... What's happening within some of our departments? Um, how much have we lost on Wormerle Springs? The pool, what about the staff for the pool? Who knows when that's gonna be able to be reopened? How many people have even been laid off in Northport? That is a huge statistic that will help us um, with our planning. Um, and we all know that the longer that we're shut down, the more that we're gonna lose in revenue and the more it's going to hurt our citizens and the more it's going to hurt our businesses. So that's kind of the quick overview as to what I wanted to talk about and hopefully y'all wanna talk about it. So I will yield the floor and go to the people that have their hands raised. So Commissioner Carison. So to me, it actually all sounds like questions uh, that could be answered in a memo. And then we can evaluate what those answers are because we do have a upcoming budget hearing that that's where this conversation is gonna take place. So I cannot think of anything that's really uh, imperative that we can stop now that's going to save us an immense amount of money uh, in any way shape or form uh, unless there's something that comes up within the next month or so I uh, maybe Mr. Lear knows something but honestly I I feel like this should be handled more in the budget workshops and um, again most of it sounds like questions that can be handled in a memo uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is a topic that just needed to be brought up to be transparent and answer some questions uh, or let them know we're even asking questions. Uh, I mean, earlier in this meeting, we pushed back the city center green. So that's almost $200,000 right there out of the surtax that, that you <laughs> kept that is going to be going into it. Uh, the mayor, uh, talked about not knowing how many unemployed. We have no clue. I mean, uh, there was one of the commission comments that I wanted to put forward. Uh, not even the county knows how many of their businesses are closed, how many are partially closed, and how many are still up and operating. Don't know. We throw around 27 million people unemployed, but we don't know how many of them are unemployed within our city. Uh, I mean, we talked a couple years ago about the business tax receipt and doing away with this hierarchy of payment and stuff and just having a flat $25 for this uh, business tax so that you're on record, uh, you know, that you're doing business in the city. And I think we need to bring that back and be talking about that because we have found a breakdown, not just in Northport but in all of the surrounding area, a breakdown of knowing who our businesses are and how we're gonna contact them. I mean, 
Mel and her team has been beating their brains out trying to reach the businesses within the, the uh, city, working with the chamber, trying to find out the answer, some of these answers. So with addressing cautiously some of these things is a good idea, but slashing everything because not knowing what it is to me is a wrong step too. So I'm in agreement with Commissioner Carazone that we need probably more information and to look at things more intelligently mm -hmm. instead of knowledgeably, instead of emotionally. Uh, something else is we would need to take a look at what those CIP projects were that are attached to uh, surtax, what they are, uh, what list hasn't been started yet, what could be on hold. So those okay. types of things need to be brought back. Uh, Mayor brought up about vehicles. Well, how many or which vehicles were purchased with surtax? I mean, those are all avenues that we could look at. But I'd really like to have the city manager also speak to how he sees it, because in this memo, he's showing a wash and he's got his thumb on the heartbeat of what is going on with economic development within the area also. So I'll yield the floor. Thank you. And we'll get to uh, city manager after um, Commissioner Hanks and if anybody else wants to speak. Commissioner Hanks. Yeah, you know, um, I don't mind, Mayor, that you brought this up. I think, you know, I think it's good, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to at least start a conversation or at least let the public know, listen, these are some, the, the, these are things we're actively thinking about. Um, I agree with uh, Vice Mayor too, though, that it's, it's a little early uh, to determine what exactly we need to do or what's going on. Um, I do know, you know, I spoke uh, multiple times with uh, city manager, uh, uh, you know, concerning what are we currently doing? How are we looking at our staffing levels? How are we looking at some folks working at home? Are we looking at even possibly them continuing to, uh, to work at home in the future? Because what this forced recession has done is it's caused folks to go a little more digital, a little more, you know, technologically advanced, uh, where a government is typically lacking. It's allowed us to catch up a little bit. And uh, we're able to look at now, you know, what jobs have to be here, especially whenever you're looking at a city who has buildings that are kind of busting at the seams, you know, maybe we can open up more space around here. So, you know, I know I've been asking him about things like that. Um, you know, also looking at, you know, I know that there's, there's unessential positions or non-essential positions that he feels that, um, that we have divided up among staff, you know, and I know in speaking with him, he is looking at, um, uh, you know, what those positions look like spread among other people, because you might be able to save a $60,000 a year salary by dividing that up among three people and giving each one of them a small raise to handle extra duties or extra re responsibilities. So I think you are right in, um, uh, you know, at least letting the public know, listen here, we're looking at these things. These, these are things that, that, uh, that uh, we haven't forgotten about. We're not just sitting on our hands. You know, we're actively having a discussion and this allows the public to do that. So I don't mind you bringing this up, but I also agree with Mr. Uh, Carasone that really the time to have the meat and potato discussions is going to be during the budgetary uh, time where we have a little more answers as to what's going on, what's kind of behind us, what's more in front of us. So, um, so I do appreciate you bringing it forth. I just not sure that today is the actual time to get into the meat uh, the meat and potatoes of it because we there's just too many unknowns right now uh, when you look at this literally this thing has happened virtually overnight and so you know to be able to take a look at it is it, it is just a little bit tough but i do appreciate you bringing it forth thank you commissioner hanks commissioner emrich commissioner emrich did you want to speak I'm, yeah i'm muting sorry no, I'm in agreement. This this definitely needs to be talked about. We need to look at it, but we also need to look at it with a lot more information. So I, I am in agreement. I did talk with Mr. Lear probably last week sometime, and I had asked him about when would be, would be a good time to talk about this, and it was through the budgetary process. And as Vice Mayor said earlier, we were already leading that way with the road drainage project for City Center Green in the earlier meeting. That, that's a savings right there. There's a lot of different avenues. You brought up good points. 
you know, have they bought this vehicle yet? Can they do without it for another year? You know, is, is the position's not full? Can we do a hiring freeze? You know, there, there's so many different avenues. Is this project been funded and it's going forward or is it stagnant? Can that wait? Maybe we can do a preview prior to the budget on just what's on our plate right now. Do it prior to our budgetary and see what where we can cut and do it. And then this way it's one meeting dedicated just to a pre-budget meeting. That's something like that. You know, it's just an idea that popped in my head to where we can go ahead and discuss it and see where we can save and cut. So I, I agree with you. Yes, this discussion needs to take place as everybody does, but I think there is a proper time and a place and having all the information is ammunition and we can go forward faster that way. That's all I had. Thank you. So while I understand that we need to have a greater conversation at budget time, that's blatantly obvious. But I, I also believe that we can, we have to do more than just talk tonight about this and, and let people know that we're aware of it and we're, we're, we're thinking about it. We have to start acting, I believe, even tonight and giving the city manager some direction on what to do. Because if we can save some money in this fiscal year budget, the 1920 budget, we still have what, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. We still have about five months left in this budget that I'm sure he has not expended every single thing that we gave approval for in September um, that we could possibly save, whether it's surtax related or general fund related, that would help boost that emergency fund that we desperately are going to need going into the 2021 budget. Um, I, I would like to see a list from the city manager within like the next two to three weeks of every CIP project that has that has money being allocated um, this fiscal year, 1920, whether it be surtax or any other funding source to see, do we still want to proceed with that, that project? Is that project in progress? Has it been started? Is it still waiting to be started? We need to know exactly where we are with every single one of those projects in detail, not just, oh yeah, we, we have an RFP out on the, on the street. Well, if it's out on the street, maybe we want to pull that RFP and not do that project this year, even though it's been budgeted this year. Um, these are the harder conversations that I think we need to have. Some of the staffing levels, I heard one of the commissioners say even tonight, you know, maybe freeze hiring. We need to give him that direction. We need to tell him no more hiring until we have budget talks in, in June um, for next fiscal year. Maybe there's some vehicles. I mean, this fiscal year we had approximately uh $4 million in vehicles that were supposed to be purchased this fiscal year. Maybe all those vehicles have not been purchased yet. We don't know. This is the kind of information we have to have so that we can have another conversation far before June in our budget talks for fiscal year 2021. I, I, I think that we need to find out what's going on with some of these departments that are basically closed. Um, and they may have staff working in other departments. We don't know this. This is information that we have to have that we, we're not getting. So, Commissioner Hanks. City Manager, when do you have in your schedule, because I don't see it directly, uh, the date for our first budget talks? Um, I believe it's in mid-June. Um, I'll find the date for you in just a second. Um, one question I can put to bed right now is all vehicles for this year, even though the majority of them are purchased out of either impact fees or capital replacement funds, which is why we set that fund up all those years ago so that we wouldn't have to have a reaction like this should something happen. We, If vehicles are due to be replaced, the funding is there and set aside for it. All those vehicles have been ordered already. Um, they are all typically ordered by the end of December so that we can actually start getting them. That's good to know. That will put to rest the vehicle question. Um, let's see. 
budget workshops with the commission start June 16th. Um, as far as positions, we currently, as I stated in the memo, have about 34 and a half full-time equivalent positions that are not filled. Um, those are- Can I stop you there, city manager? Certainly can. Can I stop you just one second? Those 34 positions that have not been filled, what departments are they and what positions are they? they can are, you get us that information? I can, they are in every department we have except for the city attorney's office. Um, everybody else has a vacancy um, of some sort. In looking at the list right now, most of them, well, 12 are in public works, 12 are in police, one is in IT, one's in finance, one and a half in parks, one in the city clerk's office, which is the deputy city clerk, one in HR, two in utilities, and three in, in neighborhood development services. Um, so those are the vacant positions. We have 72 people citywide that are currently on one of the other, one of the two forms of FMLA. Um, so they're all on protected leave of one form or another. And not all of them are being paid at 100%. It depends on the type of leave that they're on and why. Um, so that are those positions, as I stated, you know, like I said, we do have funding that will come back to us from FEMA. Yes, it will be over several years. Some of it we've already gotten back. Actually, we just got a check in the mail last week for $62,000 as part of one of the stimulus packages that we are looking to see what expenditures we have that have already qualified for that money. Um, we have until now, from now until the end of December to spend that money. Um, and like I said, we have to make sure it qualifies under their rules. There is at least four pages worth of rules that go with that, that money. Um, and there are a variety of um, different categories in those rules that um, not really think anybody wants to go into, but it's very detailed. Um, as anytime anybody gives you money, it comes with all kinds of rules. Um, as far as the question about War Mineral Springs, we have an estimated loss of revenue from there of about $218,000 due to the closure to date. Um, that That's an estimate based on a five-year average of how much money we receive from there each month. We've also reduced the costs out there by about $66,000. Um, that fund is not funded by taxpayers. It's it's a um, it's its own special revenue fund. It is was designed all along to be self-sufficient. And as it stands right now, I believe we have about $1.7 million in accumulated profits from the operation of Warm Mineral Springs. Most of that money is designed over time to be used to make the improvements out at Warm Mineral Springs. But as it stands right now, we do not have a loss, um, a net loss out there. We are actually still in the black. Um, let's see, as I stated in the memo, the increased expenditures in the general fund on top of the, the change in revenues netted out to, and yes, the number is correct, $150. Um, between our reduced expenditures and our increased expenditures, our costs are up a net of $150 because we have eliminated some contracted services that we don't need during this time. Um, we also have, like I said, those vacancies that I mentioned right now, vacancies in the general fund have equated to approximately $440,000 in savings by not filling those positions. A good portion of them are not filled due to the fact that we can't train them. Once we come back to work, a lot of those positions will need to be filled or else we will have to stop doing some of the services the public wants from us. Um, in answer to your question of how we furloughed anybody, no, we have not. Everybody that's working may not be working here in City Hall, but they are all still working uh, with the exception of the ones that are on FMLA. Um, that being said, they're working at a variety of things. Some people have been repurposed. Um, you just had an extremely lengthy conversation about economic development and all the work that they're doing to help the businesses that are still operating and making sure the ones that are struggling are getting the help they need. Our economic development division consists of three employees and one um, temporary employee that we outsource. That is not nearly enough employees to accomplish the goal of what we're trying to do to help the business community right now. So we have, um, as you mentioned, you know, Mel has reached out to every business in town. No, Mel has not done it directly. We've worked with the chamber and we've worked utilizing other staff that we're able to repurpose. As in any emergency we have, staff is repurposed to where they're needed most. And that may not be in their regular job. Um, 
what else can I tell you that um, we are estimating the loss of surtax, which does not fund operations. It funds capital projects to be at approximately right now about $586,000. And we're looking at a loss in revenue to the general fund of approximately 564,000. Both those numbers are in the memo I gave you. Um, both of those are all from sales tax losses. Um, surtax is a portion of the sales tax as is half cent sales tax. Um, surtax, like I mentioned, is not used for operations, it's used for capital projects, one of which you just put on hold tonight, which while the project was $200,000, the budget for it was $300,000. Um, we will be bringing you a list as we get those numbers more formalized as to projects that could be put on hold. That being said, we also went into the year with funding in the surtax left over from previous years. So is there a need? Well, um, to cut uh, any projects? No, there's not a need. We don't have a funding shortfall for any of the projects that are currently funded in this year's budget. Um, is it a good idea to evaluate every project? It always is. And, and you all have the entire CIP already. It's in the budget process or in the budget packets that you've gotten. It's online on the city's website. Every single project is out there that's in the CIP. Um, any, you all and anybody else can look at that at any time. I can get you an update on the status of each of those projects, but the amount of money and where the money comes from has um, always been available on the city's website. So the entire capital improvement program is out there. Um, so like I say, if you think about the $440,000 in savings from vacancies, that almost offsets the entire general fund loss of revenue. Um, that being said, I don't want people to think that we're just forgetting about this. We tracked that. These are the numbers we came up with in about the one week's time that we had as notice to figure this out um, for tonight's discussion. We are tracking this all the time. A um, little information for you on the surtax funding. Like I said, not only do we enter the year with a, a decent amount of money in the reserves from savings from previous years, we have collected as it stands almost 47% to date of the year's um, revenue from surtax. One of the big pluses to that is while we all know most online or there are online sales that are not taxed, the biggest online retailer still to date is Amazon and they do collect sales tax in the state of Florida and they do collect the surtax as well. So that is a plus for us, but surtax funding is coming in um, almost completely as scheduled. Like I said, it's about 47% year to date, um, which is about five and a half million dollars. And that's through six months of the year. So it's practically right on track. Um, yes, I do expect some some fall off on that due to this event. Like I said, we said that number is about $586,000. Um, I can get you what, whatever other information you'd like. I don't have any more than that um, off the top of my head. Um, if you have specific questions, I'll do the best I can to answer those. But I do want you and the public to know, as I've stated, we are only hiring the essential positions. And of those are only the essential positions that we have the ability to train to do their job because our jobs that we have here are pretty complicated. And it's not something I can just have somebody come in and say, all right, go off and conquer and do the world. We have to train our employees like every other business does. And if I can't do that, then I'm not hiring them right now. So I hope that helps. Thank you, city manager. Um, I know that um, I would like to see an update on all of the CIP projects and where we are in that, whether it's completed, it's in RFP, um, it's been started, it's, it's contracted. Uh, I think that's important to know, um, especially coming up with budget, but I, I, I think we need to look at that sooner. So May that way then if, the I'm sorry? May May I finish my floor? I, I was actually, and then he went into I, this. I thought you were done. I'm no, sorry. No, 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 no ma'am. He just went into done. this big, long diatribe. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were finished. I apologize. Commissioner Hanks, go ahead, please. No, ma'am. It's okay. No, I, and again, I understand what you're, you're, you're saying. I think if you take a look at, you know, what we're, what we're being put in here is just timing, right? So if, let's say we give the city manager three weeks, we're literally going to have one meeting to meet, which is one week before we have our budgetary talks anyways. So, so I think timing is a just, I just don't see where we're going to be able to really 
uh, have, you know, have the discussion because literally within a week to a week and a half, we're going to have every bit of information right in front of us. And we'll have it just, just before that anyways, because, because we do get this, you know, about a week before we're, you know, before we go in, go into the talks. So I just think, you know, you know, because of the timing that we're in, I think we're just adding an extra, uh, a pressure that doesn't need to be there because literally once we get that information it's time for budget talks and, and I think that information is going to be there for us anyways and I don't think we can make a decision uh, again without having all that information and we will be getting that like like I said within days of our first meeting that that we would have to discuss this Does anybody else have anything to say? So I hear you about budget talks starting in June 16th. And just for the record, city clerk, that is not on my calendar. Um, so I, I don't know if maybe I missed it or if it still hasn't been put on there. Um, so I'm just sharing that with you. Um, and I don't know when all of the other meetings are gonna be taking place for budget, but if it's gonna be in June, um, just letting you know that. Um, I think what I'm concerned about, and, and I'm gonna just say it right now, is if there's projects that are slated to go out to RFP or slated to get contracts written for to come back to commission, Maybe those all just need to be put on hold. Anything that has RFPs out there, um, just hold off because we don't know what we're going to be doing with them. We don't know what those projects are because we don't know. Um, and, and I know that those are important things to do, but some of these contracts don't even come back to us that maybe we want to stop and maybe we don't want to have proceed to help save some money for this next fiscal budget cycle. Um, those are the things that I was hoping to be able to give him direction on. Um, as far as some of the staff, I'm, I'm gonna point blank ask it, city manager, what are we doing with all of the staff that we have in the aquatics department? I mean, we have nine full-time employees. I don't know how many part-time employees. What, what are they doing now that the aquatic center is closed? All right, so the aquatic center employees, um, the ones that are already hired are being trained so that when we do open the aquatic center, they're maintaining their licenses and they're not being actually paid full time anyway, but um, we are making sure that so that when we can open, we're ready. If, if we let them go, they're gonna be gone. And then when this ends, we're gonna have to start the hiring process all over, which takes at least probably four to six weeks if you can find the right people. Right. Let, what does you, know, gonna, you will at that point condemn the aquatic center being closed probably till at least July, possibly August, even though we could be ready to reopen on June 1. I understand that. So what does that mean by they're not being paid their full salary? What does that mean? If they're a full-time employee making, I don't know, $30,000, I'm throwing a number out there. It's not etched in stone. What are they being paid then? They're being paid for the hours they're working. So if they are in doing 20 hours a week, then that's what they're being paid for. Um, so they're doing a variety of things. Like? Some of them are cleaning city hall. Some of them, like I just mentioned, are doing their training so they can have all their certifications, learning how to make sure they have the licenses, they keep on top of their licenses because in order to be a lifeguard, you do have to be certified. And if they're not, if they don't take the courses they need, they lose their certification and then we don't have the ability to open the, the aquatic facility. Um, if you'd like, Sandy Funheller is on this meeting. Well, she was, yep, she just put her hand up. She can speak to that probably even better than I can. She directly oversees them. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, for the record, Sandy Funheller, Director of Parks and Recreation. So our, we still have employees on site the aquatic center staff, um, our management staff and our pool tech, we still have to maintain the facility. We still have to maintain uh, the mechanicals there. So um, that's something that we cannot let go. Uh, they also are in charge of the splash pad. 
Uh, so they're going over there. We still have records we have to keep with all the readings every day. Uh, as far as the lifeguards, um, the seasonal, we are doing, or not seasonal, the part-time we are doing um, in-service training hours to maintain their um, credentials. If we don't do that, they expire, and then we'll have to go through that hiring process all again, and then all the training again, um, which would put us way behind if we're trying to open the facility. And we'd also have to find those staff again. Uh, chances are they're, they're gonna obviously try and go out and get some other form of employment uh, if they're not working for us. And we had some staff that were helping clean the facilities. They were retasked. Uh, so facilities that were still open like City Hall, the park maintenance building, um, they are taking on those cleaning responsibilities for the building. And then we also have staff that are at uh, War Mineral Springs Park. Since that is shut down, uh, we need staff there to monitor it during the day because uh, we are, do not have a national and state park concession providing that service. We have security in the evening, um, but we have to staff it uh, to make sure that nobody is going in there unauthorized uh, between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., seven days a week. Thank you, Ms. Sandy. Thank you. City manager, is it possible to get us a list of the full-time positions that are currently vacant, um, whether it be by department and when they became vacant and what those positions are called, you know, what their title is? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And real quick, Mary, if, if I may, um, there were a couple of other things that I'd like to point out that that have happened and that will happen that will affect not only next year's budget, but also some of the current scenarios. Um, one of the things that surprisingly, or maybe it's not surprising, it's just surprising to me, building permits are still going strong. Our building department is you know, still pulling just as many, if not more permits than they did before this started. Um, so our, our building industry, which is one of our biggest backbone industries in the area is actually still booming. And as far as property values, local government is significantly behind mm -hmm. the regular for-profit or business sector. Our property tax values for next year's budget will not be affected by this event. I say that because the property values are as of January 1. And as you know, for the most part, this kicked in in mid-March. So the properties were valued before any of this really started. So next year's budget for property taxes will be based on the increased property values from the previous year, which we do anticipate, as we stated in the assumptions meeting, at least a 5% increase in property value. So then that's not our only fund or source of revenue for the general fund, but it is our largest source. Thank you. Uh, Vice, uh, Vice Mayor, your hand is up. Yes, thank you. Uh, been listening to all the conversation and Actually, I think maybe a direction that we can go in. I like Commissioner Emmerich's idea of a pre-budget meeting. Uh, set it, um, you know, before the June 16th, just shortly before the June 16th meeting. But on that, um, he could bring forward to us which um, openings are vacant. You know, the, the employee openings. Uh, we could um, put a hold on all the new RFPs until that meeting so that we can see, you know, what's going on. It's only a month away. Uh, it's not going to hinder, you know, something for 30 days to hold up the RFPs, but it does give us the ability to examine all the information in that time period to see if we can or can't move forward with those RFPs. So that's what I'm leaning toward is a pre-meeting just prior to June 16th and uh, having that the, oh, I forgot to add the status of the CIPs brought forward to that pre-meeting and which openings are vacant at that meeting and then just hold the RFPs until we get in that meeting and make some decisions. Vice Mayor, what would be the point though, if it's literally just a few days later that we're having the budget hearing? Can you help me out? 
Sure, I can. Uh, this is dealing what is going on right now. The budget is actually for 2021. And so we could discuss what needs to be done in 1920 and get that adjusted before looking at 2021. Right, but, but that was the point we were discussing about doing it during the budget hearing was because we'd have all that information and then we could directly address this year's at that time. That was the way I understood it, was that we wouldn't just be talking about that. We would open up with, what are we doing right now? Where are we at? So that's why I was wondering. Okay, well, I think it would uh, expand our budget talks by probably at least a half a day or a day longer. So that's why I kind of liked uh, Commissioner Emmerich's idea of a pre-meeting so that we do get a glimpse and the stats of what this year looks like. So we can address that before we go in talking about uh, the, the new year's budget. I mean, if you wanted to wrap it all up and you know that first meeting, so be it. But I think you're gonna have to add some time onto it because it's probably going to be at least a half a day discussion. And just to let you know, the June 16th is our first budget workshop, according to city manager, that's June 16th. We have a, we have a scheduled commission meeting on June 4th, and that would give us time to digest everything that's happening with this year's budget, the fiscal year 1920, as we prepare we have that information already at our fingertips as we prepare for our talks for 2021 budget. I think it is a great idea that Commissioner Emmerich had mentioned about a pre-meeting and the list of the things that Vice Mayor had listed based on the conversations that, that we've been having to have at that pre-meeting um, for the budget. I think, I think it's, it's the way to go. Um, to actually prepare for the 2021 budget. And if we're going to have it on a already scheduled uh, a commission meeting, I'm perfectly fine with that. You know, I mean, yeah. you, know, you said the fourth. I didn't even see we had one the fourth. I'm perfectly fine with that. I, I thought the next one we had there was the ninth. So that's why I was saying, because that's literally just a week before the budget here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I think we have a meeting scheduled for May 7th, which is that first Thursday. So I would assume we're going to have a meeting on that first Thursday in June also. So, um, you know, and the information, the CIP sheets, the holding off on all RFPs going out until after that June meeting. That way then we can give a little bit more direction um, and hold off on all the hiring and that pre-budget meeting, I, I think is a great idea. So um, Commissioner Emmerich, your hand is up. So go ahead, please. Yeah, I just wanted to agree with the mayor and the vice mayor for agreeing to think. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm what? gonna go ahead and put off the, uh, the uh, um, referendum still them as well too. You know, I'm sorry, so I'm the what? The RFPs. Right. No, I'm holding off on them, putting a freeze on them until we have that meeting. This way we got that Fantastic. information. No, Fantastic. I'm in agreement. Thank you. All right, city manager, your your light is on. I do. Um, I do want to be able to say that we clarify exactly what was being frozen or what you're looking to freeze uh, because not everybody said the same thing. and. Um, as far as RFPs or formal solicitations, because they are various formats, there's bids, there's proposals, there's all kinds of, those all come to you before they're approved anyway. Um, you guys approve each one of those. If it's to the point where we're issuing a formal solicitation and it requires a contract, they come to the commission for approval. So my recommendation would not be to freeze putting them out because you may not want to freeze some of them and that's the procurement process. The actual awarding of the contract is what you all do. And if, if we don't put the, those out, that means business is going to be delayed no matter what we do. And you may not want that for all of them. So I would suggest you continue the procurement process. And then if you don't want us to purchase it, when we bring it to you, we can stop it at that point. Um, but is that fair to the businesses if they, they bid on something and then staff spends the time coming up with a contract and the contractor agreement comes to us, we don't see all of them. You see all contracts. You don't see all the agreements that you guys have. 
all of the formal solicitations come to you all. If it's mm -hmm. something is under a hundred thousand dollars, then it's not in the CIP for the most part to begin with. So what you requested, what you requested freezing, all come to you in the first place. So for example, this purchase of this possible new um, equi uh, software would come to us? No, that's not part of, but that's also not a formal solicitation. That is just, what you just talked about is our things that are over $100,000. You list, you know, if, if you want us to stop buying everything altogether, then we we're pretty much dead in the water. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. So $5,500. No, that unless they require an actual contract, if they require a contract right now, it comes to you all. Um, that's, that's a charter provision. So if it requires a signed formal contract, it comes to you all. Um, doesn't matter whether it's, $10 or whether it's $10 million, those come to you. Um, the only ones that don't are things that just go with a PO. But if it's a, um, if there was a formal solicitation issued like an RFP or an RFB, that comes to the commission as it stands. Um, whether or not it's fair to a business to submit on that, um, we can stop them. I'm not saying that we can't. I'm just saying that that means that every project that we have will stop. And so, on the back end of that, that means that you're however long they're frozen, that's how long you're going to add at least to the back end of the project and then for us to start it back up and just want to make sure everybody's prepared for what that means is all projects will be delayed. Thank you. Vice Mayor. I don't, I don't mind. Uh, following city manager's recommendation. I mean, if we have, we have the right to not accept, you know, the contract or to, I mean, I would imagine we can even hold it off if we wanted to, too. I don't know, if, it depends upon how it's worded, I would believe, but I don't mind abiding by his and then it comes before us anyhow. I do have a question though for Park and Rec, um, are they extending the park passes and the sponsorships for the time that the parks can't be utilized? And what I'm talking about is Warm Merrill Springs and the Aquatic Center primarily. A lot of people purchase yearly, you know, passes or, you know, Warm Merrill Springs is a 30 day pass. Are those being extended? I'll let Sandy answer that. Um, we, we had a conversation about it and they're all over the place, but I'll let Sandy, if she wants to go into detail on that. Sure, can you hear me? Yep. Sandy Funhiller, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, so we've already communicated with all of our um, memberships and pass holders that we will extend those passes for the amount of time that we've been closed. Um, so that's our plan. We're just keeping track of it. Um, so that'll be at the Aquatic Center and the memberships and Warm Mineral Springs. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Vice Mayor, that was one of my other questions. Thank you for that. Um, one of the other things that I was thinking about was the economic feasibility study. Um, is, I, I know this is very important to do but I also think that with this COVID-19 and this event, it's going to change how businesses operate and, and there's going to be a new business models that are going to emerge. And we don't know what that's going to look like until this passes and businesses start opening. Um, and I think that there was a memo that came out or I heard a phrase that said that our city is not looking to get new businesses here per se. We're trying to retain the businesses that are here. That's where our focus is. Do we want to pursue this feasibility study at this time or do we want to wait, you know, maybe six months to see how this all plays out? Um, because what, what may be recommended in that study may be a, a moot point or non-attainable because we don't know what this is going to look like. But what 
I believe what you're referring to is what was in my the memo that is in the backup for this agenda item where economic development, the example I used of um, areas that have changed their focus. Yeah, there it is. Um, their focus has been for business recruitment has been their number one and business retention is also something they do, but not, you know, their number one has been to business recruitment. And right now they are on, on helping the local businesses or business retention work right. through all of the processes and all of the, you know, if you think the city has red tape, you should see the stuff attached to these stimulus programs. Um, and they are helping <laughs> them aware of what they are and get through that process. Um, is, I know even I had this confusion at the beginning, a lot of some of the stimulus packages don't require you to apply to the government. They actually require you to go to your bank and apply. And that's how you'll get the package. Um, and we are trying to make sure that that's what they're doing is working on our businesses because right now business, new businesses are not opening anyway. Um, right. If you can't go out, it's kind of hard to go out and open a new business. But what, um, if you're there, we want to keep you around. So we're, we're, their focus has changed. And that being said, when this is over, their focus will change again. Um, right. And that will be back to business recruitment while still, like I said, they, they always work on both, but which one is their primary focus? It will be back to business recruitment. And at which point that feasibility study, I, I do believe is still necessary. Um, and it's not done yet, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. I don't believe it's even started yet. Um, I think you just passed the funding for it, but don't quote me on that because I, I don't want to promise that to the world. I could be um, mistaken, but that's something that when this is over, when they're doing it, they will be taking into the account the world that we're living in at that point in time, not the one that we've been living in. But if the study is being done while the world is still trying to recover and this post post COVID event, how, how will that study be valid? It will be helping to recruit the businesses that are best available at the time. Mayor, I think that's exactly the time that we need it is because we don't know. That's a perfect time to be doing a study as, you know, because at least in the past, we've always had an idea as to what history has driven. But now we're an unprecedented. I mean, this we haven't I mean, if you're alive today, you haven't seen anything like this, you know, so we don't really have a history to go by. The city of Northport has no history to go by this in its history. It hasn't seen anything like this. So I think. If, if this is what you're talking about, this is a perfect time for that. I would consider that pretty essential going into something, but you want somebody that's going to look at exactly where we sit exactly today and then say, this is, this is the methodology for it. But our today may be different in two months. That's what I'm trying to get at. Well, what, right, what they're studying today is going to be different in two months, four months and six months. Right, but that's what the city manager's saying. They're going to take into account those things, and I understand, uh, uh, you know, that you know that that's two months away. But they're going to take into account those things. So maybe I misunderstand what you're saying. Then I was saying to hold off for the four to six months to let everything calm down, so we can get a true you. recognition of what businesses okay, and those models are going to actually look like in four months. Okay, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. I thought I thought I, I thought you were saying let's just not do this right now. No, no, absolutely okay. not. No, I was saying to hold off and let let the waters calm so that this study could be done post COVID nineteen, not in COVID nineteen. Right. And I'm very amenable. I, I I just don't want to put it off for like a year or two. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, if it's something reasonable coming out of this thing where, you know, we can see it, but it's, but it's relatable to where we're coming through and going into where we're going. Um, I can see that. Cause what I don't want to do is I just don't want to push it off so far that we end up with six, no. two, two years of unable to recruit because we're having to wait for it. So oh, oh, I hear you now. Yeah, the business models for our businesses are going to be completely different in, in two to six months than what they are right this minute. So that's why I was just saying to put it on hold. Um, that was just a suggestion that I had. Um, so I see Commissioner Carasone's light is on. Go ahead, please. 
So again, I think we need to see how this impacts us. How far are we along in this? Has it gone out to bid? Is there anyone that's already bid on it? What's the legal implications? What have we already put into it? So we can actually see what it is that's a possible loss or a possible gain. And quite honestly, I'm just, I just don't have enough information to make any decisions of this maximum capacity. I'm telling you, as someone who sat through the recession, this is no recession, folks. It's mm -hmm. not. This is a short-term decline that while it will have immediate impacts right now, it's going to be a very fast uh, a swing up. So I think that before I'm willing to say that, you know, uh, we need to stop everything, we got to put the brakes on everything, I'm not willing to do that. I'm willing to see where we are in a month. And, and when we have the discussion at um, not only the budget discussion, but as we discuss other things that come online, just as we did this evening, you know what, fine. Uh, you know, maybe it isn't something that we want to take on financially. Maybe we don't find that that specific uh, program or project is is worthy of a life safety. And but to to say that's it, stop, put the brakes on everything. I I can't do that. We've got new hires coming on in the police department that are essential to uh, you know what has been needed. We've got new hires most likely in road and drainage to handle the overwhelming amount of work that's already a lot of this work is still there it's still there so i understand you know the problems that people are facing financially at this moment but trust me this is nothing like that recession people are getting uh are able to get on and get their unemployment at 100%. People have the ability for small business loans as much as it is a pain in the butt, trust me, I've been trying. Um, you know, there's avenues that have actually been taken this time around to help those who are in financial, uh, you know, devastation. I just don't, I mean, I, I see that it's raining but I don't see the sky falling, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. And, and I really want to reevaluate in a month so that when we're doing budget, we'll have, you know, a better overview of what's going on citywide and we'll know where we're at. And quite honestly, within that time, again, anything that comes up independently to the commission, and I trust the city manager, he's not going to hire someone that's not essential. He's not going to go for, I mean, this is a man who we put in place who has a financial background. That's a whole point. So I don't have a problem with this. I, I know he's not going to make rash, rash decisions knowing that he's got a better handle on the economy than we do. So I'm okay. I'm all right, but I, I do think that it merits a good discussion come June. Definitely, we all are going to have a different viewpoint when we get into the budget hearings for next year. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Luke, and then we're going to get a motion on the floor. Uh, in regards to that feasibility study, uh, I am all behind it moving. Uh, the Economic Development Department needs every tool in the toolbox because they are the ones that are aiding these businesses. And with Northport having 67% of our businesses home-based, uh, they're going to need every tool in the toolbox. Uh, it may look different for a while, the environment, the um, business environment, but those guys doing those studies know what they're doing. And uh, I mean, the Economic Development Department will change a focus come budget time. They're not going to be putting all their monies and resource into going out finding new business. They are going to be working with the retention aspect when it comes to budget time. 
So their focus will change, but as far as the fe feasibility study, that's been put off way too long. And I really, really would not want to see that one put on hold at all. Our businesses need the help. And so our economic development team needs all the tools they can get. Thank you. Can I say something, uh, Mayor? Just I'm sorry, ahead. who's Can speaking? This is Pete. Thank you, go ahead, Pete. Um, I, you just, I think every one of you has mentioned the economic feasibility study and Mr. Miles just let me know that's scheduled to come in front of you all for approval on May 12th. So it's not started, but you all will make the decision one way or another of, of whether to award that on May 12th. So thank you. Um, you can have a, a, a lovely conversation that night about it and see where it goes. Thank you. All right, let's get somebody to make a motion or I'll pass the gavel if you want me to. All right, Vice Mayor, I'm passing the gavel to you and I'll go ahead and make a motion. Okay, go ahead. I make a motion to have city manager prepare for a meeting on June 6th, I'm sorry, June 4th, that first Thursday of the month in June. June 4th, um, have available to us the CIP status for all CIP projects. And that status would include where we are in the project, um, whether it's like RFP or it's been started or it's complete, where specifics of the CIP status um, to hold off on hiring of anybody besides police and fire. Um, the the uh, vacant positions by department and position and the date of the actual vacancy and the employees that are out on FMLA, those 72, what is their uh, expected date back? Because I know FMLA is on a time frame. And that's my motion. All right, there's a motion on the floor by the mayor that the city manager bring back to us on June 4th meeting the status of each of the CIP projects where each of them are standing. Uh, she wants to freeze hiring of everybody except for fire department, police department. Would like a list of all vacant opening openings with the date that they became open and also an update on the length of uh, FMLA uh, employees. Is there a second to that? Hearing no second, I will go ahead and pass the gavel back. Thank you. Does anybody want to make a motion? Uh, Commissioner Carason, I see your light on. Yeah, I'm not sure why a motion is necessary. Um, I'm not, I'm thinking that telling the city manager how to manage the city teeters on a violation of the um, charter as it is his job to actually manage the city. So I'm not going to tell him who to hire, who not to hire, or what to do. These projects, yet again, will come before us, and that's when we can make the educated decision at that time. Um, so I'm not sure what kind of actual motion is being requested. Maybe the June 4th meeting portion. I'm okay with that, but anything else, I, I have full trust in and the city manager making sure that we are doing things to, um, you know, not get ourselves in a financial bond bind. Well, there's no motion on the floor. It did not receive a second. And I think we are well within our rights to um, help the city manager by giving him direction on what we as a collective body is looking for 
budgetarily, we have this fiduciary responsibility too. So um, I don't think we overstepped our bounds at all because if we did, I'm sure that city manager would not have only had one hand up, but he probably would have been standing on his head at this point. So um, there is no motion on the floor. City manager, I do see your light on. Thank you. Um, I'm not gonna promise on the, I'm not the attorney, I'm not gonna promise on the charter application of the one portion of your motion that related to hire, hire freeze. Um, that was my biggest concern and the rest of it. Um, if you wanna have that information on the June 4th, I have no issue providing you all of that information and making an agenda item myself for the June 4th meeting. I don't need a motion for it. The fact of the matter is if one of you had asked me for it anyway, um, you know, it would have been on the agenda. Um, I've never told any of you we can't have an agenda discussion. Um, I will gather all of that information that you just asked about as far as when positions became vacant, what's vacant, I mean, it will be update as of the day of that meeting or certainly as of the agenda post. Um, I will send you the information as it becomes available as well as put it on the agenda of a CIP status update. Um, and frankly, I'm fighting a killer migraine, so I'm trying to remember the rest of the things you asked for um, and attempting to remain conscious. So but you will have all of the items that you asked for on the June 4th meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice what? Mayor, I see you. If you got to unmute yourself, Vice Mayor, we can't hear you. That was the same thing, the issue that I had with the motion was freezing everything, everybody but fire and police. Uh, he needs to be able to hire anybody essential or that that he needs to in his position. The rest of it, I had no problem with. He already is stating that he will bring it forth at that June 4th meeting. So as far as I'm concerned, this one's done. Thank you. Thank you. And and just, just, just so you know that when we approve our budget, we're approving hiring people or we even tell them not to hire people. And some of these positions were already approved by the commission. And I, I really feel that we can also just say, hey, hold up. You know, times are different now than they were when we approved the budget. And I, I, I don't think that that was overstepping bounds, but I'll, I'll get with city attorney on that one. Well, he's, um, so, already, he's already held back on hiring everybody. He's already made that decision not to hire anybody unless they're essential. So, and he hasn't hired anybody to this point. So uh, I'm with Commissioner Carazone. I trust him to be able to know who's essential and not essential and hold back at this point in time. June thank you, 4th, Commissioner. June 4th, right around the corner. You're you got to unmute yourself, Commissioner. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I agree with Mr. Carasone and Commissioner Luke. The reason why I didn't do it, I just didn't feel like it was necessary to have a motion for it. Uh, the city okay. manager has already shown that uh, that 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 restraint already. He's a big boy. Uh, he understands. He's heard all this, and he understands. And he's heard each one of us. I guarantee you, in individually, chew his ear about what's going on. What are you doing? Where's the money being saved? Uh, you know, over and over again. So I think he understands the direction that we're, that we're looking for. And I fully trust that, he'll, that he will do that because he knows as well as all of us do, if he doesn't, he'll be chewed for that too. So I know that, uh, that, that uh, I fully trust and I fully believe that, he's, that he understands exactly where we're coming from and that he's going to, uh, to uh, take care of business accordingly. And, and I agree 100%, but I also understand, too, that sometimes when we have these kind of in-depth conversations that kind of squirrel all over the place, that I want to make sure that he knows exactly what, what that direction is, and that's why I wanted to put it all in motion as to what we expected to have back to us, and anything in addition would be, would be icing on the cake. Um, so that's why I was going to a motion. It failed. We'll move on. We're done with it. Um, let's see here. We now have public comment number seven. Anybody public comment? No comment here. No, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Commission communications. We'll start with Commissioner Carousel. Nothing. And I've got to go. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Have a nice day. Hey, Commissioner Carousel, can you get the birthday card signed, please? Sure. They're in your box. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, someday. Thank Bye. you. Commissioner Emrich. I'm pretty sure I signed them. Yes, you did. 
Okay. They're in her box. Other than that, nothing, ma'am. Thank you very much, Commissioner Hanks. No, ma'am, I've got nothing. Thank you, Commissioner Luke. Or Vice Mayor Luke, I'm sorry. I do. Uh, question as to how are we doing proclamations uh, since we're on this schedule? Any of them that we have received, if we're not having that meeting, we've been mailing them to whoever's requested them or providing, to, providing them to the departments once they've been signed. Okay, so we're not reading them into the record before we're sending them out? No. Okay. Uh, I already mentioned how we probably need to discuss that business tax receipt so that we can keep better tabs on our businesses for communication purposes uh, and marketing within the city. Uh, wondering if there is an update on the wildlife corridor out at Spring Haven. Uh, that property is no longer on the market. So I am wondering if uh, there's been an approach to the owners to see about them selling the property with it being off market. So I'll reply to that. Yes, we have reached out to the owners. They did take it off the market. Now they are in the process is my understanding um, when I'm speaking um, to assistant city manager this week that they're actually putting it back on the market. Um, they didn't get any offers when they had it on the market for $1.3 million because it appraised significantly lower than that. Um, so it was taken off of the market. They left the realtor they were using and made the option of putting it back on the market for $1.5 million. Um, <laughs> My word. I'm sorry. No, I had the same reaction. Um, uh, okay. I know typically in, in my past life that when I couldn't sell something for a certain price, I didn't raise the price, but that's, um, I guess that's the option they're going with. They okay. believe it's worth that, um, even though they didn't have any offers at 1.3. Okay. And they're getting one from us for 1.5 because it's not worth half that, according to our appraisal. The, the next update, uh, I had requested an update on Legacy Trail. I actually almost couldn't sleep for two nights because I was so mad about this one. And I mean, we were sent a link um, for the memo that showed the top three priorities and all three of those priorities were North County. Every one of us sat in the same meeting and I know the mayor and myself went out with two of those uh, county commissioners and viewed it. And we discussed in the, in the meeting where both commissions were together that we were gonna go with the Shuey Ranch paved path, trail. And so I questioned one of the commissioners on a, a talk thing that he was on an uh, online meeting and it, the question didn't get asked on the meeting, but he sent me tagged something on a Facebook, I believe it was of uh, the county commission. And they talked about doing the, the dirt power line trail, that they have been working on that power line trail. And I don't know if they're using money of that 63,000 that Northport only received two, or excuse me, 63 million, and we only received 2 million of. Yep. I don't know if they've spent any of that 2 million to improve something that we didn't even approve. It, it, it just baffles me. So I followed up with, well, that's not the trail that the both commissions approved. So then I got a response, well, we're doing something with the North End or North Trail and doing something with the South Trail and it will end up being, you know, a really nice project. I don't know if that was talking about two trails or one trail. There was something said about a 30% design. So I don't know if they're only at 30% for the Shuey Ranch design. And that's what I wanted to know. Where are we at with the Shuey Ranch, both commission agreed upon trail? We even had um, John Thaxton give $30,000, I believe it was, for the connector bridge to it. 
you know, that is what that 2 million was supposed to go to was that trail, not redoing a paved path or a dirt path that already existed. They said you could have big tire bikes out on it. Well, that doesn't help a lady with her baby carriage or, uh, or a handicapped person with a wheelchair. They don't have big tires. And I mean, we cannot accept just this dirt path being done for our city when we were told that that paved path was gonna be a, a huge part. And actually they told us even in our meeting that it would be the first part to be done so that they could let everybody see and know that this was being addressed. I don't want to be lied to. I don't want to think that the wool was being pulled over our eyes because I tell you what, that might be the last thing that I ever vote for that goes for the North County and the South County gets nothing. And that includes some of the discussions that they've been having lately. It just so irritates me. So if I'm going to ask again, if we could get, because I know we got to go through the hierarchy. We just can't ask them. We got to go through the hierarchy. I want to know where we're at with the Shuey Ranch Pave Trail and Connector. And so do I. Well, so do I. thank you. Uh, Project graduation, I want to bring that one up to you guys because graduation at the high school is more than likely going to be delayed. So project graduation, they were concerned about us donating the truck. Now, what they're thinking of doing, because they don't really have time to raise even more funds, they're wanting to coordinate with um, the actual high school and what they do. They have a dance and stuff like that for graduation. So they're wanting a combined activity. They just wanted to make sure it was all right with the city that they still give away the truck. Because it's not just project graduation anymore. It's a combined event that they're gonna be doing. I mean, it's like a project graduation but they wanted to make sure that it was going to be all right. Does anybody have an opinion? <laughs> City manager, I know that we did some asset dispositions uh, recently and there was a vehicle on there slated for project graduation. Um, I think what Commissioner Luke is, or Vice Mayor Luke is asking is if the, I think his, battery just died. I see <laughs> it's going to die. Um, I think what Vice Mayor is asking is, can we still donate the truck even though it's not considered project graduation per se? It's something morphed. If that's the desire of the commission, yes, because it's what they're doing is, is my understanding is they're having, as the Vice Mayor explained, a joint operation. It's not going to be the formal project graduation event that they've had in the past. But at project graduation, they give away a bunch of stuff, one of them being the vehicle that we donate. Um, they still want to do that giveaway. They still want to honor the seniors that are graduating from Northport High School um, this year and, amongst other things, give away that vehicle. Um, if the commission, the vehicle is donated to project graduation, um, which is a nonprofit agency, and we've made that donation, and it is with that be donated as part of project graduation. I'm not the attorney here, but to me, I think that they've probably met that requirement. Um, the, you know, even if they don't have the actual event, unless you all tell me to tell them, look, if you're not gonna have the event, don't give the vehicle away. Um, they might still be in okay shape anyway, but I think it would go a long ways if you all said that, you know, we want you to still do um, give the vehicle away to a senior, even though you're not having your normal event, you know, they'll give it away in the way that the event that they're going to be doing. Um, if that's the will of the commission, um, I think it will probably go a long ways to them and a long ways to meeting any ambiguity of this event. Like you all say about that. We, um, Commissioner Armert, you have your light on. Go ahead, please. 
Yeah, one second, I'm running out of battery. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, the one thing that I look at on that is um, the same as what Mr. Lee was saying. I got no issues with that. I, I believe it's going to be a combined uh, uh, project there. You know, project graduation would still be giving the truck away, even if it was at a different venue. It's still going through them to give to that senior. So I think they've got all their bases covered. I'm still 100% behind let them, letting them have that truck and giving it away. I don't think they're doing anything wrong whatsoever. To keep it clean, city attorney, do we need to get a consensus or a motion on this? Clean is always good. All right. I think so you, consensus get is a fine. consensus. And Go I'm ahead, for me, yes. So what, what is the consensus for the record, please, Vice Mayor? To you allow to project graduation to receive the truck and give it away in their combined event with the high school. Okay, I have a consensus and Vice Mayor Luke uh, for giving the truck for the project graduation that was designated for project graduation to be for their combined event, whatever that may look like or be called. Uh, Commissioner Luke? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Hanks? Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. And I'm a yes, and Commissioner Carasone is absent. Thank you. Uh, anything else, Commissioner uh, Vice Mayor? Two things. I think this one's going to be a real quick one to the city manager. Uh, have we made any kind of adjustment to summer camp opening because some people will be going back to work and the kids are not going back to school? So some of these families are going to need child care. So I'm wondering if we're adjusting summer camp time frame. We have looked into whether or not we could pull that off. And unfortunately, due to the hiring process, and when we plan to hire those people, no, we could not start earlier. I, I did ask our parks to see what we could do to make that happen. And that is unfortunately due to the late nature of it, not something we could pull off. Okay, thank you. That gives me an answer to, to feed to people. Boys and Girls Club is ready to jump on being able to help people with that, hmm. but they have to wait to see what the criteria and regulations are going to be. The last thing is another thing that I'm very disappointed in, and that is the designated lands for SLOC. Um, I'm, I'm working with the, the land foundation here in Northport and Barbara Lockhart actually sits on S Lock, and S Lock has been telling her that we haven't submitted any of those properties that we discussed back in June uh, to be submitted. And so there seems to be um, a breakdown of whether we did or didn't. And it was very embarrassing to me because, you know, I'm course going off on the county saying oh yes we did and I don't know if we did at this point I'm still digging into it but they sold a hundred I think it was 182 lots and within those 182 there was one section where those um what's those little birds called those okay. <laughs> scrub jays the 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 scrub jay 22 lots were sold that could have been in the S lock and some of the properties that were sold were already or were designated and already put into S lock people asking them to be conserved and the county sold them. So I don't know where the right hand didn't talk to the left hand at at the county but there was obviously something messed up goofed up but I think it's imperative that we get our ducks in a row or our little scrub jays in a row and take care of these uh, applications to SLOC. Thank you, that's all. City Manager, could you please give Vice Mayor an update or forward the memos that were sent out to SLOC in the past couple of weeks? Because yes, I had the same conversation with him. Oh, I've got, I've got, I've got some emails, and that's why I brought it up because I'm very disappointed in what the email said. <laughs> so, but I think we need to make sure we're we're all on the same page and working toward the 
the same end goal. Thank you. Thank you. So I will keep it very short, try to anyhow. Um, I had a meeting, you know, it's, it's hard to believe that three years ago, I think it was this week we celebrated, we are celebrating our third anniversary as being a kindness community. Um, I, I think at this time we need kindness more than ever. Um, I spoke with uh, the founder, Ms. Jacqueline Moore, and she is using the kindness community as a platform to do a study of some sort, uh, to check on the well-being of the citizens uh, collectively with uh, COVID-19, how they're faring with this, how businesses are faring with this. It's going to be an email type survey to uh, uh, a select email list. I'm not sure who. Um, and what she is wondering is if possibly because this is going to be an email that's out and the results are actually going to be shared with the city um, so we could help in preparing for post COVID-19. Um, she, she's kind of wondering, would the city be able to put out a, a blast on social media and not click this link to take the survey, but hey, check your emails, you might have been selected to participate in the survey. And if you did, would you please fill it out? Because it's going to benefit the city, it's going to benefit the surrounding community and give us some tools in the toolbox to be able to use. And it's something that is being done privately so they can do it quickly and give us some information. So I, I think it's, it's, worthwhile. I have other information I can forward to the city manager, um, but I was wondering if I could get a consensus to see if we can kind of say, hey, be on the lookout for this because it's going to start May 1st, which is actually Friday. And they're hoping to have all the results tabulated and shared in June, right around budget time. This will be perfect timing. I'm kind of mixed on it. Um, I understand the value of what the information would be, but are we also going to stir up the people that there's only select people taking the survey? It's not as though it is a click on here and take the survey, but it's only going to selected people. And it's kind of no. So ahead, I I'm sorry. Know we'd be stirring a hornet's nest by you know, advertising that, okay, you might be a chosen one or you're not. So I'm mixed with it. Well, our citizen survey only goes out to a select group of people also, and that's even a less, less amount of people. That's um, by the city. I know. But I, I was trying to alleviate your concern about being a chosen one. Um, I don't know how many of those citizen surveys go out. About 2,500? I, I don't know the exact number, but that does sound about right. Okay. So actually, I was just. Actually, I believe they are sent out to a select, but you are all, you can also click on, a, on, the, on the line and take it also too, because I've clicked on and taken it and was not mailed one. It's done both ways. It's, and they send out enough to make sure that they get enough responses to be statistically um, valid. Right. This is, this is going to be going to a lot of people, but um, so I was just wondering if I could get a consensus to have the city, uh, you know, put something on social media. I, do, I don't know what your thoughts are on it, city manager. Uh, if it's the will of the commission, we can do it. Thank you. So can I get a consensus, um, Commissioner Emmerich? If you could please unmute. I'm, I unmuted. Yeah, I, I don't have an issue with that. Um, I, don't, I don't see why the city can't help gather that information as long as it would be like something on our website to where they could just click and go to. No, but, that's not what it is, Commissioner Emmerich. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I want, I want to make sure that you understand. It's not a link that they're going to be sharing to take the survey, uh, this kindness collective COVID-19 How's Everybody Faring survey, they're, they're um, 
their survey company that they're hiring for lack of another term is going to be sending it out directly. And this request is for the city to say, hey, be on the lookout. The kindness community is going to be sending this email. Please make sure you complete the survey for them. Um, so I hope that helps clear it up a little bit better. I'm sorry if I didn't explain it very well. Let's make it a that Facebook post or something like that that just shares with folks to look at it. No, right. Yeah, that's, just, that's what I was getting at. You know, and and I said that that's where I was going with this. If it was just putting it out as information, right? I that's all it is. That that's all I was trying to get at. I, I okay. I was going talking about if it was a link, like Commissioner Luke was talking about, it would needed to be more fair. But if we're just helping put out information, I got no 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 problems with that. Thank you, Commissioner Hanks. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I too uh, was a little misunderstanding uh, some of what you were saying because I thought you were, you were wanting the city to, to help put forth some of this. And so, uh, you know, I just didn't want the, the city to be a part of propagating or, or, or being the one that's trying to gather this information for them. So I'm fine. If it's just thrown on a Facebook page or, or something like that Thank says, you. Hey, listen, here it is. Then I'm fine with that. Absolutely. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Yeah, I'm fine with it also, as long as it definitely ties in them being kindness community and that we had that proclamation stating that we are a kindness community. I want it tied. It is. Thank you. And I'm a yes to so city manager. There you go. Thank you. I will get the information and I'm sure Miss um, Moore will be in touch with you also if needed or available. Um, so at this time, I have no more commission communications. Now we have legislative uh, city attorney. I have nothing, Mayor. Thank you. City clerk. I have nothing. Thank you, city manager. I'm good, thank you. Okay, I do have a couple questions about your post report. Um, I wanted to double check with you. Um, on January 28th, we gave direction about renting the Al Gall Center. Um, here we are, the end of March, three months later. Can we get an update or something on that? We haven't received anything. I don't know how that's progressing, what's going on with it. Can you send an update by Friday about that? Yes, ma'am. I thought we had, but if we haven't, I will set, certainly send you something by Friday. Um, I can tell you real quick, nobody replied. We'll give you a formalized update on that. Thank you. I had um, a question and you sent it to me. I don't believe it was sent to all the commissioners. Yeah, we'll make sure it is. But yeah, the Thank initial you. answer is nobody replied to the solicitation we put out to the offer. Thank you. Yeah, if you could send that formally, I would appreciate it. Um, so we also on February 6th asked for a memo to go out to our state representatives regarding Toledo Blade and 75, making it a priority to install a stoplight there. Um, I was wondering if that has been done because I haven't received a copy of the memo. And if it has been done, could you please send it? And if not, could you please I'll make sure find out what's going on? I, I will get you an update and a copy of the memo. If it hasn't gone out, it'll go out. And if it has, I'll get you a copy. Thank you. Last one was on uh, March 3rd, we gave direction for a letter of gratitude to be sent to Mr. Sitting with the, um, for his retirement. Yes, I haven't, I'm sorry. It did go out. I remember signing that one um, that was more recent. So I'll get you a copy of it. Yeah. When, when we request memos, I would think it just would be common practice since we gave the direction or consensus for you to include us in a copy. Um, that way, then we can cross them off the list, and Miss Miss uh, Carrie can cross them off the list too. So, um, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. I have nothing else for your reports. If you have nothing else, <laughs> thank you very much. All right, seeing no other items, it is now nine fifty-eight. We are before ten o'clock, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.